Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 135 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Salaikum Prabhupada, Salaikum listeners. It's good to be here. Yeah, we've been um, pretty pretty regular, um, which always makes me happy. And in the midst of the summer, that can be tough, I know, with uh, kids out of school and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, we've had a pretty good cadence of episodes, and so we are um, always appreciative of when that happens. You and I are both getting prepped for our big trip to Chicago. Yes, so. yes, that's going to be that's going to be real fun. Uh, really jam packed. Yes, a lot of stuff planned, which inshallah the listeners will get uh, access to that's right. over the course of the next several weeks and, and maybe months. But uh, <laughs> exactly, looking exactly. forward to that. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited. We're going to yeah be out there for a good week to ten days. But we're fortunate today because I think we have uh, Chicago or a piece of Chicago here with us here in the Bay Area, and that is our guest for today. Omar, if you can tell us yeah, what Yeah, for is. sure. And, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion that piqued my interest. Hopefully, we'll get to cover at least some of that on the show. And to do the intro, Omer Hasib formally studied Arabic and the foundational principles of Islam and Quran in Chicago. Uh, that led him to move to Morocco to pursue a full-time study of Arabic and Islamic law. He then began his studies at the Qarawin in Fez, Morocco. He received his Shahada. Uh, along with his studies there, he began private studying under scholars of Morocco and the Saharan Desert. He holds licenses in legal theory, usul, Maliki law, grammar, creed, and the prophetic biography, Sira. He served as a chaplain at Cook County Correctional, then served as the religious director at Islamic Foundation in Villa Park, and, the, and subsequently served as the director of religious affairs at Tatlif Collective. He's currently continuing his studies at Al Azhar University, Cairo. Welcome to the show, Sheikh Omer. Thank you so much for having me. This is really exciting. This is super exciting for me. It's an honor and a pleasure, honestly. I'm, I, this is like one of the, this is actually like one of the, and I don't even, I'm not just saying this, like I actually regularly listen to the podcast. Nice. So I'm coming in as like a fan and I'm sort of fanboying a little bit right now too. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're looking forward to, to, to get to know you as well. Well, Omer, you and I, yeah. uh, we, we go back. And so this has certainly been something you and I have talked about. Mm -hmm. And I've looked forward to this conversation formally. You and I have so many people that we share in common, right. relatives relatives of yours who are friends of mine. So, um, and of course, uh, we overlapped at Tetlif as well. But um, I guess, um, as we often like to do, and as someone uh -huh. who has listened to the show, you can, uh, you know, where we like to start things off. And that is, uh, you know, your sort of origin story, <laughs> uh, where the story begins, as it were. Tell us a little bit about your background, family background. We'd love to kind of start there. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting, because I think I sort of a, like, origin story is weird because I feel like I'm still sort of going through an origin story right now. Because I'm like, I'm not, like, I'm, I'm older. I'm not, like, super old. And I think, like, I, there's so much more to experience in the next, hopefully, inshallah, if it allows me to see the next how many ever years. But I think for Raised Pie, we talked about this for a while. There's a lot of cultural overlaps that we have as well. And, you know, intellectual overlaps. And there's a lot yeah. of, uh, of, of interests that we have. And I think that does begin with our upbringings. A lot of us come from a certain background. My family is from Madras. So, and in Chicago, I don't know, it's not like the Bay, whereas you have like dosa stands everywhere here. But like, it's in Chicago, like it's like one in a few. Because Chicago's yeah. all like Hyderabadi people. It's all mm -hmm. the Swiss people. It's, and, a, it's a big Hyderabadi diaspora, for sure. It's a huge yeah. diaspora. It's yeah. like... And uh, so, yeah, families from there, I'm from Chicago, the suburbs of Chicago, uh, grew up in that community for, I never left, really. I mean... So, you were born in Chicago? I was born in Madras. Oh, sorry. sorry. I came back at like Madras. one. So, my Got parents it. moved there. My mom went back to the uh, kid birth. I see, I see, I see. I think, Omar, on, on your dad's yeah, side? Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. So, my parents are from Hyderabad, but mm -hmm. my dad's side, they moved from Madras. Oh, no way. From yeah. Nilur. Oh uh, wow! Would, okay, which is near Madras, I believe. Yeah, it's right? like a. I think it's a, It's like a train station okay. uh, area over there. The it's same, the same, same state, city, essentially. Okay. It's just uh, so Madras and Nulu are essentially the same thing. Um, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, my dad then moved as a as a kid. As a, yeah. To Heatherbond. Oh, so yeah. You, as a, your dad was born in Madras, like in in this there, small. It's town right around there. I don't know if he was born in one place or the other, Got but it. they were they're from Nellore. Oh, okay. I thought it was like his fam his parents, not necessarily he himself. Yeah. And now you're making That's me want to go and, and talk to my dad and well, figure all this out. But you know, uh, we've tried. We've tried. Yeah. We, we've tried making <laughs> but that But there's happen. a Heather body connection. Maybe they're yeah. they're maybe their dad. His dad was working right. in Nellore or something like that. But there's mm. a connection. But that makes sense. I think there's there's a strong. There, I mean, it's all the Deccan region, right? Yeah. It's all the same region. I remember the last time we. Yeah, that's right. It is the same region. 
contagion. I think we met in Chicago not that long ago when we we, we met over dinner. And yeah. it was like the world's yeah. most interesting people on that in that table. But I remember you talked a lot about experiences when you used to go back and visit and some of, I guess, some of the like scholarly tradition in your own family, right? Yeah, so this is something I found out way later. Yeah, right, right, um, right. But my father's side are in the tobacco business okay and they're indigenous right so they're sort of we have we have, we have certain there's a certain connection to some of the ahlul baits that had occurred there and then married into our father's side of the families and you'll see a lot of like i'll give you an example the the son one of the sons of sheikh abdul qadr jilani is buried in proper madras Really? And there were uh, Sahaba that are also buried there, like Sayyidina Tamim al-Ansari, who's an Ansari from Medina, who's buried there. Those are things I revisited after traveling. Because, you know, when you're like sort of an American kid. Going you know, back home. Going back home. It's like, it's like, well, you go back home and you just sit in air conditioning. Like, that's all you want. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah. You're hoping grandpa, like, is generous enough to let you sit in air conditioning and you just, you know, there was not much exploration that you could do at that time. My mother's side is, uh, so as my father's side is a little more, you know, we would say that there's, there's a hood tendencies. They have hood tendencies. So. Please, uh, please expound. Is that <laughs> if there was a, like, sort of, there's a, <laughs> they have... You have to have thick skin around my father's side okay. a little bit. Okay. You know what I mean? They're not going to be as perhaps as dignified in terms of... Got it. Um, lovely people. Right, don't get me right. wrong. They're probably going to hear this and I'm going to like, <laughs> kind of like, what would you say? They're great people. <laughs> I love them dearly. Yeah. But they, there is the, they're, they're in the tobacco business, man. Like, mm -hmm. is what you think of tobacco, like Henry David Thoreau tobacco, what he talks about. It's very, very similar, but very indigenous to like the, the south of India. Got it. And... And they used to have like a, it used to be sort of like a tobacco mafia. I don't want to indulge too much because I don't know if this is like legal <laughs> stuff, to be honest. I don't want to put him, whatever. But like, there is a, there was, there was sort of like this weird, like there was like a family few, like this ver tobacco family versus this tobacco family. Yeah. Right. And they were called BDs there. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Of course. Um, of course. And my mother's side is really sort of educated, right? So like my, they all went to college at least and got their masters all into literature I, was, I just wanted to say like for, uh, I, I don't know why i'm pausing here to educate our listeners but like a beady uh is, is is so it's basically tobacco that's not in 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 wrapping paper mm -hmm. or or whatever yeah uh, but it's rather it's mostly it's leaf. leaves yeah. yeah it's leaves that they use it's like pine you could smoke it's right <laughs> I don't no, know if it's, it's the betel leaf, it's, it's the beetle leaf or whatever they yeah. use for bon, but I'm sure it's a special kind of leaf. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. So, um, yeah, so and you look at my mother's side, they're yeah. a little more perhaps illustrious. They come from more upper class, upper echelon. My yeah. mother's uh, great grandfather moved um, as he was the, um, he was the ambassador to the Turkish empire at the time to, to and yeah so they, they, this my mom my mother's very fair skin you'll see my father's looks very indigenous very dark skinned okay um but and yet they're both from south india they're both from south india yeah, right yeah. so um and they my mom grew up around and my obviously the like english was my fa my father's side of the family spoke like very strong tamil urdu mm -hmm. like like madrasi urdu which none of you guys probably understand yeah it's very very like um it's sort of like creole Mm. Uh, is really difficult to understand and then my mother's side understands it obviously they speak it but English was their standard in the home I see and almost okay. an Irish accent an Irish twang of English to the point that my friends don't recognize my mother being yeah. an immigrant at all because they think she grew up in the UK but that's because she, she studied in these like Irish hostel with nuns I think historically like the south of India had a pretty substantial I think Dutch base this is before the East India this is in um, this is in Pondicherry and Goa. Sorry, yeah, See, Pondicherry, Pondicherry and Goa. Yeah, Pondicherry. yeah, which is both which is a Portuguese, which no, is West Coast. That's I think I think I don't know much about Goa. I know where Goa, Goa is. Goa is west. Pondicherry is south Got of it. Madras. It's way south. That's but what I'm thinking. Madras about. I'm is thinking very much influenced by the British Raj Got to it. the point where even the shirts you have Madras pattern shirts. Mm. Remember Madras pattern yeah, shirts? That's right. Right. That's Sorry. from that's from Madras, and it was and incredibly. And I confused literate. the Portuguese that I'm thinking of in Pondicherry to. Pondicherry to um, like the Dutch. I don't know why I said that. And then of course Goa, right outside of Bombay, and I, uh -huh. I lived in Bombay, and so you know I've been to Goa several times. Oh but really? Yeah, that's like a couple. That's like not even an hour and a half drive. 
Oh no way! Okay, from Mumbai. I, I've never been Bombay. to that site, of course. Yeah, yeah. But the, um, again, big and I, Portuguese I don't, colony. And if I'm honest with you, I don't think I've explored. I, I want to go back, but I want to do it right. Mm. So I do want to go back one day. I don't even know how long it's been. And my, so my, my, I only have one grandmother that's living in my grandparents. Yeah. But I do want to go back and actually explore this with what I know about things now. And having said that, so my my mother my mother's side comes from uh, my my grandfather introduced coal engineering to India. My mom, my grand, my nana, so mm. my mother's father, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think so. You know, they, they came from like real estate and things like that. However, they also ran an orphanage um, and a madrasa, which became a big sort of mega mosque, so to speak, over there, or sort of the central mosque, the central jamia. Mm. <clears throat> and that was started by my great, great grandfather, mm. whose name was Maulana Abdul Subhan, who went to Al Azhar University at a very young age. So he first he went to, I think he went to Dioband for a short while, yeah. and then he moved to Al Azhar. That is in like the 40s, 30s. Right. He passed away very, very young, and he came back as an Azhari scholar. He has his own tafsir of the Quran, and he has his own, yeah, he has his own tafsir of the Quran, and he has a couple of that he wrote that uh, my aunt has that I want to lay claim to one day yeah. and take. Uh, Maybe translate even. In, in, in tra and it's in Arabic, yeah, it's not yeah. even in Urdu. Right. Right. Um, it's all in Arabic. And my grand par and his grandparents they're from Hadramaut. okay i was just about to ask you yeah. about Hadramauti culture or influence like influence and, and influx coming into madras and that region because yeah. in in hyderabad it's there are, very, there are a lot of Hadramautis. a lot i yeah. mean in fact you have a, li a line of uh, habaib mm -hmm. who are settled in hyderabad sure uh and they lay claim to the same you know lineage as the habaib in hyderabad yeah, I mean, the story... Um, in fact, there are neighborhoods in Hyderabad that are known for, to be predominantly Yemeni, Yemeni people, uh, yeah. immigrants. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of Yemeni blood. Right. Right? I mean, they look very similar as well. Right. To If you look at Hyderabadis and South Indians, they, they yeah, almost yeah. look no, very, very similar. You're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could get confused you by seeing confused. someone, especially from that region in Yemen, but I would say even in Yemen as a whole, but where they, they're just, they look more subcontinent yeah. than they do even Arab. Or and or uh, Khadij, like like I'm not sure the, there, there's there's khilaf in the story mm. and sort of a difference of opinion in, in the story and and but there is veracity in terms of a lot of the Shafi'i schools within and a lot of the Dharqawi that are actually in Kerala, the South India is all Shafi'i generally. Mm. Now you have sort of a quasi imported of sort of a Saudi iteration of Islam that has been imported. I think in the 80s and 90s, oh, yeah, and that's sort of default. Mm. Right now there, um, and there are groups of people, like there's a great, uh, there's a place called Nagor, which is where all of the awliya are buried there. And there's very Sufi influence that that it has, but they're all Shafi'i, like they all follow the Shafi'i school. Reason being is there was a the third or fourth masjid that was a fourth masjid that was ever built in the time of the Prophet ﷺ was in South India, right? Really? It's called the Chairman Jum'a Mosque, which is a tribe of people that had essentially but well, you um, said one of the first the third i think or it's fourth. the fourth yeah, yeah i think no no i think it's a f yeah it's the fourth i believe i'll check again but i'm pretty sure it's the fourth masjid and it's built at the time of the prophet sallallahu and the story is that there was a this this jamir was built or this mosque was built because there was a tribe that was doing what's called the ribata where they stand outside the camp where they sort of look uh protect the camp from yeah. other tribes attacking right and the tribe member was named as the Cheriman uh, Tamil tribe member. And he's in the in the south of India. And, uh, you know, we always have these sort of stories about the coming of the last prophet. You know, all of these different traditions talk about the coming of the last prophet. It, it, it's in the Chinese tradition. It's in the Veda tradition. It's in, you know, even in the Jewish tradition. And our mm -hmm. monotheists who talk about the last prophet. And they have their own signs. But when he was doing the Ribata, he actually saw the moon split. He saw the moon split in half. And he realized what this is. He spoke to his elders and they sent him to Medina. And he searched for the this Arab prophet. Wow. And the prophet and he gives bayat to the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet sends him back, but with who? With Sayyidina Malik bin Dinar. Okay. Malik bin Dinar is buried in Kerala. And his madrasa is in Kerala. So you can go there. His maqam is in Kerala, India. And Amazing. this becomes there is now where do you come from? You come from Yemen. That's the only line, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, where did the elephants come from? They weren't coming from Africa. Yeah. Abraha brings them from Yemen. But where did Abraha get all these elephants from? <laughs> he got it from India. Like so, this relationship has yeah. already sort of begun between him. And even even when 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 Kaab writes the the poem to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the 
you know, to get the prophets after he sort of betrayal, quote unquote, so to speak, mm -hmm. sort of Gab's redemption. He compares the prophet to the Al-Saif al-Hindi, the Indian blade mm -hmm. in the poem. Mm -hmm. So they were very familiar about our culture, mm -hmm. about this indigenous Muslim, uh, indigenous Indian culture. So when they come down, all some of the Ansar come amongst them of Sami Mansari, and there are perhaps a lot of other uh, companions, you know, that are less well known that had moved with them. And if you look till this day, if you look at like the Hindu marriages, they wear a shawl on their right, they wear a shawl on their right, and they wear um, a silwar. They wear a shawl on their right. Like, where did they get this right shawar from? That's straight from where Yemen. Did, it's straight from Yemen, yeah. right? And they get the salwar, which is the same exact thing, the little lungi thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, where did they get it from? They got it very specifically from their, from from a culture that was introduced by the Muslims. Right. And to the point where, and this is, you know, one of the interesting things. Oh, here's like another you would call it a, like the loincloth. The loincloth, right? Translated, yeah. Now, one of the interesting things is I was reading years later. Now, this is when I was in school in the Qarween. I was reading a book called the Muwaffaqat of Imam Shatabi, and there's a chapter in the Muwaffaqat where he talks about a tarjum al Islam fi lughat al ukhra Okay. That changing is, is sort of translating Islam in different languages. And he puts conditions in and he says, if you have an understanding, the one that is, there's a qaida in, in Maliki fiqh that essentially, to paraphrase it, the onus will always be on the tabi'i ala al-mutabi'un. Ala mutabi'in, that the one that fought the, the one that introduces the followers upon the one that follows them. So it's up to the one who knows, right? Because God asks in the Quran, are they the same the ones that know and don't know? Mm -hmm. So there's a responsibility upon people that have a firm grounded understanding with Psalm. He said, if it leads to the non-negotiable principles within Islam, then there is no problem translating this religion into a different language and attempting to to bridge the gap between those that know this is a principle in da'wah. So, having said that, there's a really weird language that the companions came up. It's called Arabi. A-R-V-I. Okay. Because the Tamil people couldn't pronounce Arabi. Mm -hmm. They kept saying Arabi because they didn't have a ba. Yeah. Right? And that is Arabic. That is Arabic written in Tamil script. So, they had an amalgamation of these two different languages. This starts way before Urdu. I'm, this is what I'm saying. So, so the, this dates back to this Arabi language, or, yeah. the, or the remnants of it are found from the seventh century. Seven. This, this is like this is um, sixth century, seventh century, seven, eight years after Hijra. Okay. okay. Right. So Habib is probably like recently just passed. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so that I mean, it goes back that you know, and then there's a there's an island if you look outside of Kerala called the Lakshwa Deep Islands. You, they look like Cancun, right? <laughs> but it's ninety-nine percent Muslim. It's a dry state. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq construction outside yeah, construction the window. In the back. Sayyidina Apologies. Abu Bakr Siddiq's grandson is buried there because he was sent there by by to give da'wah to. Gets caught up in a storm, ends up in this island. Is like, okay, this is where God wants me. So he's buried in those islands. So it's very interesting. Obviously, I didn't know any of this until recently, okay. back from overseas, because a teacher had told me there's a lot. He's, he said there's a lot of similarities between you, which I'll get to, inshallah. But we should get back. Yeah, we're going on a tangent. No, just to the, 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 it's, it's amazing. Forever. It's amazing how there's these sides, the main action, if you will, the main stories yeah. happening in Mecca Medina, right? Is yeah. these, 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 these side like, quests. Yeah, right? these side quests. Exactly. Side quests, right? exactly. <laughs> I was gonna say like a metaphor. There's there's like a side quest is the perfect metaphor. Yeah. Exactly. It's sort of you know when like yeah, it's like sort of. Aragon is yeah, there they're you in go. the Middle Earth, they're exactly. fighting from Middle Earth. But there's like the ends going on over here, <laughs> and the elves it. are fighting over there in Rivendell. Like there's all these different yeah. things that are happening to for this amount of victory to actually you know yeah. manifest itself. That's yeah, right. it's a great, it's a great point. The side quests. <laughs> so so okay. So Let's in take terms us back of to Chicago, I yeah, guess, right? just yeah. in terms of yeah. so you're growing up. Um, in uh, the 90s in Chicago. I was when, born in 92. 92, okay. Yeah. So when, God, are you always growing up with this a very... Sorry, I have to pause and yeah. say how old I feel. Sorry, let me just... <laughs> no, you're not. Come on. I graduated high school, bro. In 1992. Bro, but at least you're using the, the, the modern lingo, bro. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm, using it, I'm using it colloquially from the 90s. Uh, yeah, it, I, it, my kids would say, brah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I'm totally, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm having a, almost like a boomer moment because I yeah. am saying bro. Yeah, yeah, that's Wait, are you, are you, you're, not, you're not a boomer, are you? I'm not. No, you're not okay. that old, bro. I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we're, we're, look, we're children of the 70s. We we're we're, okay, we're, we're both, like... Uh, so. Gen I, X, look, I got like no, Gen X. Yeah, I got no. I got well, no that's, that's, a, that's a great era to I be born. No, I agree. That's I, a great. I, I'm sorry. I, there's I, a lot of that. Things. I agree, and I'm gonna yeah. always hold that over your generation for sure. <laughs> Coming back, even fashionable in terms of trends, like yeah. 80s and 90s. There yeah, yeah. Side yeah. note. So I graduated high school in 92. 92. Dates myself. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. side note. 
my kid was wearing like a Guns N' Roses shirt the other day. I'm like, oh, Guns N' Roses, how huh? interesting. And, but she had no clue. She's just what, wearing she was just, it. Was just a cool shirt with cool Guns N' Roses. Right? You go to <laughs> any of these mall, stores in the mall, yeah. you see Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, you'll see Led Zeppelin. Pink Floyd. Um, Pink Floyd. Yeah, they actually have no kids, idea. They don't. They, no, 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 they don't. That those are even That's bands. Just, but those are just trendy shirts They're to just wear. trendy shirts. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so, so you're growing up in the 90s. When when do you kind of start your when do you start your journey into spiritual, into well, spiritual reality? I'm, I'm, I'm a kid uh, in the in the 90s. The right. last thing I remember in the 90s is like the last shot by Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember like, sorry, game five when they lost and I, I like cried in the closet or something. So, you're a Bulls um, fan. Of, of course. course. I mean, yeah, of yeah, course. yeah. And then Chicago. I mean, and, and I'm a Bulls fan because I watch, remember, I'm a real Bulls fan because yeah. I watched 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004. Uh, so, like this one, Ron Artest, Brad Miller was in the Bulls. <laughs> so, like we weren't winning any games. Yeah. And I was, Eddie Curry was on the Bulls. So I, I was, Man. I pride myself in staying I think through thick and thin. People outside of Chicago don't, I think, appreciate how deep, and I'm, if you want to say red and black, that, that Chicago, you know, basketball fans were on. Yeah. Because I remember one of my earliest trips to Chicago, this would be circa 93. Mm-hmm. So pre Rockets championship, but nonetheless, right? I mean, and I remember meeting some of the some of the folks that I would still to this day be very you know clo- like friends with who are from Chicago, and this isn't like hyperbole. This isn't you know them trying to you know pick on me or bother me, but literally this is a serious conversation. I remember about who would win between Michael Jordan and the entire Houston Rockets. <laughs> <laughs> like one on one on five. Like you know, one on, you know what else yeah. is crazy? Yeah. You know no, no, what else not, is funny about yeah. that? I like how and, you, being a Rockets fan, said pre pre Rockets because that's your kind of your like start your calendar start well, right? What, like, NBA calendar. No, and then again, I'm thinking, and again, making me feel how or making me feel so old. You have no memory of the Rockets championship because you would have been like three and four years old. Yeah, I was. <laughs> that, no, right? no, no. Sorry, two and three. My math is. My, uh, yeah. yeah, that's coming up on 30 years. This season years, will be the yeah. 30 years of the Rockets championship. Oh, wow. SubhanAllah. Yeah, that's just I wild, bro. I will say for the Rockets, Michael yeah. Jordan said the only person, per, the only player, he quote, he said, feared. The only one he feared that we don't have an answer for is Hakeem Olajuwon. Yeah. Mm. So I would say that. Same year. Same year. Yeah, yeah. drafted. So he, uh, a lot yeah. of people forget. And in yeah. fact, was the number one pick that year. The number one pick. And there was a year Over he led. We number one pick, yeah, and then we had the bus, uh, Boise something, Sam Buzzy, whatever, and then it was Jordan was third pick. Sam, Sam, Sam Bowie. Sam Bowie. Yeah. Yeah. He was the bus. Our resident. I, I will just yeah. make one one Rockets comment because uh, I am I am I am the biggest uh, Elajuan fanboy this side of Houston. That's they, for they, sure. They, how good Elajuan <laughs> is. This side of the Grand Canyon. This yeah. side of the Grand Canyon. It's amazing. No, nobody ever says that picking Elajuan over Jordan. In the draft, it was a mistake. That, yeah. that tells you how good a lot of he was. But okay, yeah. so you're into basketball. What so, else are you growing up? Growing no, so, up I mean, with? this was this was there was no like spirituality thing. You're just sort of culturally Muslims. Remember, like my parents aren't old. Like my dad's born in '63. My mom's '69. They haven't hit '60 yet. Right. So they're they're younger. They're wow. sort of this generation which didn't grow up with like you know at, at this point there's sort of a distaste for any sort of religiosity. Um, this is already where religion from the back home culture is relegated to the bottom of the, the totem pole. Um, In this fact, is the, even the maybe seen as a source of like being held back. Being held back, regression. Like, yeah. I'm not going to say that they had any maybe a proper analysis on anything, but this is just what the thing was. I mean, this idea that a lot of our families came here for like hijra. So, you know, they came here because this was America and that what? was it. The land of, yeah. This was yeah, the land of opportunity. Young, opportunity. Your parents are young. So my parents are a lot younger. So yeah. they've experienced like my mother didn't wear the hijab growing up. She wore it like maybe a lot later. But I think what you're but, pointing to, though, I mean, I agree. You, your, your parents are younger or represent a younger influx of immig- immigrants. Nonetheless, I think what you're describing, though, is very much in sync with what I think immigrants in the 70s and, and even mm-hmm. late 60s experienced. Mm-hmm. That's our, our parents' generation. Yeah. Right. What what Omer is describing. I mean, would you when you agree, Omer? Yeah. Is very similar to what our parents encountered. Yeah. By but, and large, they have their own religious awakenings later in life mm-hmm. but when they came here it was just, it was purely let's assimilate let's, let's assimilate you let's, know. i think it depends your birth birth your birth order it because <laughs> it i mean not to get too on, yeah. too on a tangent like i'm younger compared to my older brother and sister mm. so my mom had gone through her religious awakening by the time i was like eight right true, so true, that true, matters true. versus for sure if for i was sure, 15 sure. 16 17 yeah good point good point but good point. yeah i mean i i can relate because it's my brother is 17 Mm-hmm. There's 13 years between us. You're the oldest. Well, I'm the oldest. It's just me and him. 
Okay, right. It's just both of us. Mm. No, no. And really? I can, yeah, it's just me. It's just, it's just me. I'm, my, my, I think my, my, you know, between us, there's a complete difference. Obviously, though, but he's also experienced it because, like, I'm, like, his big brother. Mm-hmm. So, like, I would take him everywhere. But that's a different conversation. I think back to the point is my, yeah, yeah our parents weren't, our, weren't, you know, like, I think one time my parents saw, sorry, they're going to kill me for this. But he's like, yeah, we came and, like, you know, we have visited nightclubs at that time. Mm. but you know and i it's hilarious because i see them I'm like this now is hilarious. Right, right. Like, this is wild right yeah and yeah. i think i'm also at that point in my relationship with parents that we have very open conversations nice. because i need to understand that narrative thank you in order to do anything now beautiful i can't not understand that narrative and also learn to appreciate it and learn mm. to appreciate the fact that that there was a very strong understanding of like it was not through, it wasn't, look, in that first catalyst of a taste of Islam wasn't necessarily through holding on to deen. It was really holding, or religion, it was really holding on to their culture. culture. So then mosques in Chicago, and you know, already know Chicago is built in silos everywhere. So Chicago had these mosques that were basically become these H1 visa mosques. You came there and everybody <laughs> right. had an H1 visa, builds these mosques, yeah. and it becomes this networking for a sense of community, which, which has its beauty and it has its pain, of course, right? right? And not that that pain has completely gone away. There's a lot to work on. But that's like my parents' generation. They, we were not mosque goers. Like, we didn't have the masjid to go to. My The generation before my parents, like, my parents, like, siblings were a little older or maybe, like, uh, cousins who came there who were maybe 10, 15 years older than them, they had, like, the masjid community. So, my cousins over in, in Michigan, right? right? They were just, that was their community. Like, of they course. were always in the masjid. Right. I remember even going there for Eid at times and they would use the the masjid kitchen to cook the Eid meal for the family party. Like there was an ownership of the mosque. They grew up around the mosque. I never necessarily had that, nor was I part of a a, a legacy family yeah, in Chicago. Yeah. And there yeah, are, okay, right? per, per, per yeah, those. Just to give you a sense, his mom is as old as Samina. Oh yeah. my, my, my mom, sister. my mom, my, my mom sister. and Samina Basha yeah. were really good friends. No, a different. Yeah. My, my my sister is also Samina. She was also yeah. born in yeah. the yeah. In 69. The same but, year as as yeah. Samina Basha. For sure. Yeah. So so 1969. Yeah, uh, yeah. His his sister, my cousin. Well, they're both my cousins. But yeah. Anyway, sorry. And, and wow. I'll just say one. No, that is wild. And I'll just say one thing, and and then we can we can just move the story forward. But you know the fact that your parents told you about their experience, the nightclub, or whatever you want, mm-hmm. yeah, that tells me they now have faith in who you are today that they have the confidence to share something with that because not you know i think a lot of parents they wouldn't share that unless they believed the person they were telling could take it and and was mature enough and, and they trusted and, enough to, and to situate it. it where it needs to go yeah and, yeah and yet, you yeah. know but i think that's a fascinating conversation because i think something you said earlier which was you know why that part of the story is important to you because it it informs how you do the work you do today. And and by that, I mean, you know, you're, you're an educator, you're a teacher, you uh-huh. you know provide content in the community. The, the da'wah, as it were. The da'wah. The da'wah, da'wah exactly. Yeah. The da'wah. And, and so for you, I think that's very astute of you even to point out, and I think something for our listeners to pay attention to, which is to take ownership of your history and your who you are mm-hmm. as a person, as imperfect as it may be, it's going to inform the work you do and it's going to inform who you are. Yeah. And we shouldn't shy away from it. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I almost want to, I'm trying to make sense of that. And then what Omar said also, because I think there's merit to both, but I'm, I'm trying to see where, you know, where I think maybe the sweet spot is. Mm-hmm. Because on the one hand, I think you, you almost owe your children that kind of level of, of rawness and vulnerability to be able to share that. And I struggle with this as a parent, because on the other hand, if you, if you don't share that level of vulnerability, then I think two things happen. One, your kids never feel comfortable enough sharing their own vulnerabilities right. with you because they see you as, as this, you know, role expectations, model, right? expectations, ex- exactly, which is already kind of baked into the system because you're their parent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that anyway, if you're lucky. Right. And then number two, though, I think it also doesn't teach them the very real value of the fact that it's not where you've been, it's where you're at. It's 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 the fact that human, hum, the, you know, the human experience is one of a potentiality. Yeah, you went to the club back in, back in yeah. high school, but now you're at the masjid and now you're studying Dean seriously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, a part of like, this, and this is not to say like, th- this was, and a lot of it was also like my, I think that generation of immigrants trying to just experience what America was, not that this was their like regular scheduled programming, mm-hmm. right? Like this wasn't something yeah. that there's like, we need to see what's, what's that, like, how do you network it? You're in America. You have, my dad has a boss, his work, you know, yeah. all these different things. Right. This was sort of like, there was no, there were no rules to this is what I was saying. Uh-huh. There was no guideline. You just sort of went along. And I think, I think that's when, 
I went to like, like my mom put me in Quran class and that was just like the Pakistani auntie that, you know, you got dropped off at someone's house. Huh? You got dropped dropped off at somebody's house. You remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. You got dropped off someone's house and like, you're there for like two hours. You do your first like khatam of Quran type thing. And then I think when I was in middle school, my mom put me in like my first experience. And this was only, which is really powerful as I think about it. Now I'm realizing it. My only real exposure was the book was really the, like, my cousins were all really active. I wasn't. Interest. Yeah, I know some of yeah, your so my cousins, cousins were, and yeah, yeah. older cousins, older especially cousins. whether it's Michigan or even your cousins in, in Chicago. In Chicago, yeah. yeah, they were already engaged at some right. capacity, and right. they had their own journeys. But they're all a decade plus older than me. Yes, right. Yes. So like, at they're some, more my vintage. They're 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 um they're seasoned vets <laughs> by this point. You right. know, right. I know some of his right. Yeah. Cousins, so the, the, right. I'm yeah, sure. and yeah. um, shout out Tariq Hafiz. Shout out Saud Ahmed. All the of the show. All these cats, right? Janae the Rahman. Yeah, they're all they're seasoned vets by this point and they've had Although, their, i think janae's younger than me so i don't want to yeah, make him as old as he's 82 so me That's he's right. november 11th 1982 i'm november 11th 1992 what november 11th? Same, yes are That's you my birthday you're november 11th too yes i do oh we're all november 11th that's wild 11 11 yeah i never had school on my birthday 11, 74 11. you never had school on your birthday so i'm old enough where better was not a holiday yet? yeah <laughs> that's funny he's 10 years now i think he was probably in in terms of seeing having yeah. a vulnerable right like elder brother, he was probably the closest thing. Yeah, to although me. he has an older sister, right? He has an older sister, but obviously he's a dude. We're, we're like no, a bunch, no, no, we no, had no, this like yeah. He's exactly my 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 middle brother's age. Yeah, him and Masrur are like classmates, very close, right? And they're yeah, now yeah. like if you look at them now, they're really involved in like Dadal Qasim mm-hmm. and all these different things. Yeah, but he was like the closest in vulnerability. But you also these guys already were going through. I'm, I was young, so they were already having their own squad of friends, and they're going through their own experiences. So I didn't know the intimate. It, they were sort of like the benchmark, and I was like, I don't. I'm not really down with that. So I'm fascinated by that because, see, one thing I always reflect on is the fact that when I was coming of age, when mm-hmm. I was a teenager, there were very few people who were of that, like who were of the that vintage ilk, that yeah. they're ten years older than me. And so they've been through this 10 years ago. Right. They've been through what I'm going through 10 years ago. Right. I mean, I know you grew up in a smaller town, Omer, but like in Houston, right? I mean, we think of people that we know. Mm-hmm. I mean, Asad, for example, yeah. did the music to the show. Like Asad was, what, five, six years older than me, but he represented very few. Like, whereas I'm thinking in your case, Omer, just the number of the sheer volume of people I know who are my age and came of age in the 90s. Those are the people that were 10 years, 15 years ahead Older. in the da'wah than you were. Yeah. So I was like, how was that like? Because we we lacked it. Me and Omar's it's, generation it's, had very few people. For sure. It was different for me because they grew up a little more isolationalist. Like it was sort of, you know, the the high school lunch cafeteria where everybody sat with their own squad. The Muslims, so, you know, you had all the, the mainstream mm. Americans and you had sort of these different pockets. I never was isolated. Like all, most of my friends were Muslim. Right. I never had most. I had like two Muslim friends growing up. One of them was Wait, probably most like of your friends friend. were non-Muslim. Yeah, yeah. Like so. I never had Muslim friends growing up like that. I got it. I, I never, I never had the awkwardness of being part of the crowd in my high school and my school and whatever. Like was that I was because very much did some of these institutions let us down? Because like I'm thinking what happened to MSA? What happened to Minna? I mean obviously MSA comes later, but like Minna was vibrant. I mean when I was in high yeah. school in Chicago even. My I only some... exposure to like I so let me say my you yeah. know my first exposure to like Muslims, Muslims? Yeah. It, it was one night, I remember. It was I mem- I don't remember which one it was, maybe ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand. But 98 whatever you could correct me because i'm about to tell you landmark moment okay sure. which is like my first was i it's not happening in chicago and it's i don't know what it is at this time i just like the relatives came like my cousins came and that was their like lab, that was their labor day vacation yeah. so my mom and dad they never attended them whatever like wow. they just went to go visit the family so we went to visit family my grandma's there and my cousin calls me and says princess diana died it's the weekend. August ninety seven. August 97. My uh, first sister yeah. as a married couple. <laughs> yeah. So my wife and then and I, I told yeah. my grandma, and she starts to cry. Yeah. I'm like, why are you? Who's this white lady? And why are you crying that she died? Like, you're like six, know? right? You're like five or six, something like yeah, that. Yeah, Maybe I yeah, five, six, seven. Yeah, like that was my only experience with like the mainstream Muslims. Yeah. That bulk. After I that, I have no recollection of being part of. A well, large schism of Muslims I ever. Wanna, I want to say that was yeah, that was that that was the Chicago Hilton one. Chicago Hilton one, of the one first yeah. Ones, yeah. The this Chicago was when the Hilton. community obviously like now if you come back to Chicago, the community has you have like if there's one road right, there's like seven mosques. Yeah, and they're all really renegade mosques. If I'm honest with you, you have like yeah. the main mosque, and they're all built out of rebellion. <laughs> I like Mubarak on all of them, but that's just the reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of their names are even I'm not going to mention them, but some of their names are even low key like yeah. ethers, like no Vaseline names. 
they're sort of a, <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> that's totally. hilarious. But but no, that's that was when no, but the, when, when we see the community was yeah. Eid because it was in a McCormick place and everybody yeah. came to McCormick place. Yeah. Like everybody yeah. came to the central location. Now that's not really the case, it's right? Not, yeah. Um, but let's come. I want to come back to Isna because yeah, I, I do want to dig into why that's not the case because we were touching exactly. on that we're off topic. About, right. But I want to just continue your journey. I want to come back about, to that. I think let's okay. come back to that. We always we always tend to forget. No, we won't forget. I almost want to kind of. Well, this was well. Well, this was this it, tangent, if you will. Sure, this was, it, I don't think it is a tangent. It's kind of informing. It's sort of part. It's sort okay, of part of, of your because, story. Well, it is because I didn't have access yeah. that younger kids now have. That's okay, what I'm asking okay, to, enough, right? to so. this this amalgamation of exactly. variety of of information. I would be, I would hesitate to call it education at times. No, it's, but it's there's right. parts of it that are education. Yeah. But there's really a lot of information out there that sort of the. Wait, are you talking about like like the Isna scene? I'm talking about, I'm talking about YouTube and Instagram. Well, we were, and, so just no, to set context, so, what yeah. we were talking about offline was how the McCormick Place Isnas were massive. Forty thousand people flew from all over the all country. Over the world. I flew from from Spokane, Washington. Yeah. Uh, and it was a life changing event. But now. In two, tw- fast forward to 2023, you have ISNA. Is it even a thing where people mm-hmm. come from all now over the country? That is a conversation I want to get to. Yeah, but, that's what. But, that's what that's, but that's why I think is but, because of that that level that variety of things you have access to. Part of it is okay. What do you do with the big? Con- because when, when you okay, how could you see any speaker other than ISNA outside of ISNA back then? VHS, could, VHS, <laughs> or you had the tapes or yeah. Humra Productions, yeah. Um, or if you were lucky, they visited your community. Yeah. So I know that that's, I guess, what I find fascinating is the fact that in spite of the fact that at this time, literally 97 ISNA, ISNA is boasting the crowds of 30 to 40,000 people. It's peak Lollapalooza. Almost, almost peak. Almost yeah, peak. Yeah. I think it peaks later, but it, but it, it's, it's like it's, live aid for Muslims this right is, now. Oh, totally. Yeah, but yeah. I'm saying this is the trajectory of ISNA, right? For me, 93, 94 begin that trajectory where it starts attracting tens, tens of thousands mm-hmm. of people. Because prior to that, is for those who attended ISNA in the 80s and even early, early 90s, uh, well, let's just say 80s. They It was more like a local kind of Midwest thing. It was a few families who were very active with ISNA, that kind of thing. But when it begins turning into this massive convention where at one point in American history, it is the largest convention in America, period. Yeah. So that is so right. 97. It's already on that trajectory. So I'm curious then, why is it that it hasn't sort of it's not pervasive or a landmark thing to go to year after year, just regardless of where people are in their religiosity or connection to the community. Why? Especially as someone like yourself who you're living in Chicago, the Mecca. Of, I, I don't think I've been to the convention and I don't even know how long. Right. Why? Like you said you showed up and it was like you heard. Are you talking pervasive about in the 90s or Yeah, yeah no, because he, he was sharing yeah, his kid. experience. He yeah. came as a kid. Your cousin said. Princess Di died. Yeah, know, it looked like, like the it looked like it looked like Umrah. Yeah, yeah. Remember back then it was no, like of course it, I it do. looked like so Umrah. My thing but that was like the first time your family was there and the only reason they were there was because they were there was like a family reunion. For sure. We used to have one day out of the Istan convention where it was our makeshift. We would meet for lunch because we had family coming over from all over the United States. And so we used it as an opportunity, it's speaking it's of Samina Basha, common relatives to mm-hmm. Samina and I, we would meet year after year at Isna would be the meeting point. Right. So I'm picturing the same thing with you and like your cousins, okay? Yeah. But yet you're saying though, and I don't think your parents are unique in this, they're, they're emblematic of, a, of, of something that's happening in the community where in spite of Isna attracting these massive crowds, it's still, there's still people who are just not connected to that whole thing. Forget about yeah. what's happening now. Back then? Back then, even. And I w- I'm curious, and what I'm trying to ask, and I've been trying to, sorry, prolonging this, like, I've been trying to ask is, why, like, why do you think that was the case? Where there was no, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think religion has always, like, religion, specifically Islam, has always ridden the wave of fraternity and a sense of community, and more importantly, a sense of, like, uh, belonging in a large scale, where you see people with familiar experiences. And um, you're saying that Isna didn't provide that. I, I think that, it, whether it was intentional or not, okay. it just happened, like, where, where like, you're, you, you're lost from your family wherever you come from. Now, here, here's an interesting thing. Do you know what happened every weekend on the same year? You know what other convention happens in Chicago? Of course. You know what you want? The Imam Wa'ath the Muhammad community. Yeah, right down the street in Right down the street, right? Every year, oh, it always used to bother me. I mean, I'll be it honest. Was so it was interesting because how are how do you like yeah. how do you step in Chicago <laughs> without kissing the ring of the really our patron saint? Thank you. With all intents, like you can't. Look, can I tell you something about Imam Muhammad before? Mm-hmm. This is really important. Please. 
interestingly, his name was Awar Thaddeen Muhammad, the inheritor of the religion. And I don't know if you've ever visited his grave in Chicago. I have. I was at his funeral. At his, yeah, subhanAllah, which is at the mosque that I used to work at, yeah. right? Yeah. I and that, there's an interesting story about that mosque that the young people IFS, don't know about. Sorry, Islamic IFS. Foundation. Yeah. The first one is that, I, I you know, before... Dogar Saab. With Dogar Saab, may Allah have mercy on him. May Allah have mercy on him. And, and his best friend who also started the masjid at the time, they both passed it. But her, I, I remember calling her, um, his, because they were passed away by the time I worked at Islamic mm-hmm. Foundation. So okay. one of the adib is like, anytime you do something, you call, you always call the elder. Yeah. This is like one of the timeless adibs of our community that we lost is actually like seeking something called ithin, right? You ever heard this, like the permission of things. Permission of things. So Beautiful. I called his wife and she's never mentioned before. And I called his wife and I said, hey, you know, I got this position. She has no idea who I am. Are you talking about Dora's wife? Dora's wife. Mashallah. She's and a beautiful, like, amazing, wonderful, wonderful, amazing, amazing woman. woman, right? The, you know, she has, she this, lives in the Bay now. Yeah. 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 I and see auntie all the time. I, m- I remember, I remember asking her. She's like, "Of course. What's the what's the question here?" She's like, "You have all of my du'as. Like, there's no question. Thank you." She, she was also, you could tell, this was awkward for her because she's like, "I don't. This is really weird. Like, why are you asking my?" It's like, "Why wouldn't this was your house, right?" Man. And then I called. I was gonna save this for later, man. But it, I mean, to me, that says more about your character than no, than, than the person who you're asking. It's really the from. people that we were bu- built around who built us. Look, man. But you gotta you gotta understand where I'm coming from, and Umar knows this. I, I'm I'm a curmudgeon. Uh, I'm an old I'm I'm a crusty old dude now and and for me and like i said omar definitely knows this that it, it is a rarity for me to meet people under 30 who impress me well we have we have these conversations all the time yeah, all the time like people under 30 do not impress me in fact the opposite and i think i've literally encountered maybe one or two people who break that you know or or, or outliers to that and you're definitely one of them. Of them. no no I'm, I'm i'm saying this to you in your face i know I'm he's not, being sincere because yeah, yeah. we've had these conversations <laughs> uh so 100 percent. my daughters and my wife who don't listen to this show but if they were here in my house right now they would they would be like oh yeah yeah D- dad says that all the time yeah anyway well, i appreciate that Sorry. a lot i mean we're, we're really only riding your coattails that's um, a lot of you, you know <laughs> i'm being honest with you that's not that's just the reality in, in the people that we've been around I, I called Dr. Her name is Dr. Shakila. She was one of the founders as well. And I asked her permission. And she could talk, mashallah. She, she gave me an entire history of things. And I asked her, like, permission. She's like, okay, first of all, who are you? <laughs> I told her who I am. I said, I'm, you know, I'm going to yeah. work here for a bit. Right. And she goes, this is in- interesting. She tells me this story about her coming as an anesthesiologist at the University of Chicago back in the 50s, mm. right? And then they would call her Dr. Tequila because they couldn't know what Shakila was. They were like, they would just call me Tequila. Right, that was just my name, and she was like, "It's really interesting to talk about." She was like, "The conversation of like where are women in Islam and women in community." She's like, "You guys think those conversations like we just that was our space, that was my chair, right? Right, like we had to be part of this community." And she actually made, you know, the fez cap that Elijah Muhammad wore with yes. the thing. She actually made it for him as a truth between the Sunnis and 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 the nation and she showed me pictures where was she from you said again? from chicago oh i don't know she's probably from pakistan or okay something. okay but she showed me pictures oh yeah she's from pakistan yeah. her and her husband took may allah have mercy on him took elijah muhammad to karachi and she showed me pictures of him in the karachi home what? well like i'll send after the thing yeah. i'll send you like pictures i have in my house Ajib. right and I never uh, even he knew he went amazing. to Pakistan. Yeah, he went to Pakistan when Malcolm became Muslim, and he used to come to Chicago when he was that for those that short period of time where he was so sorry when he was mainstream Orthodox Sunni Muslim. Who do you think her husband was? His hospitality, and she told me she said this is a trip IFS right IFS. She said her husband already had the idea of IFS like they were already talking about making this community, and it was sort of this idea that was it was built off of a house, and they had this idea of making a masjid, and she said he asked. Malcolm X read Fatiha on the plans. And Malcolm made Fatiha on the masjid. <laughs> Nobody would know about this. Islamic <laughs> foundation. Islamic foundation. Yes. How many more mosques have these stories? Communities have these stories. None. And it and brings tribute. Like, I'm impressed by it, but it scares me. Because look, Allah says, La tukunu nasu Allah fa ansahum anfusihum. Don't be like the ones that forgot God. He made them forget themselves. Yeah, that's right. Like, in order to us to move on, we have to know, like, this is such a big part of our narrative. And then when I went overseas... I told, this was like year, you know, year four, I was telling one of my teachers, I'm going back to visit my mom and dad. In Morocco, he said, he said, he said, La tansu al ziyarat al warathidi Muhammad. He said, don't, don't forget visiting warathidi Muhammad. I was like, how the heck do you know about warathidi Muhammad? I was like, wow. you're some Moroccan sheikh. Like, yeah. how do you know about this? And then I came back and you had this experience. So it always was, 
200,000 people were taking shahada within 72 hours or a week or something. This is the largest mass migration we've seen. Conversion. Conversion, sorry. Migration into religion, I meant like conversion. <laughs> sorry, 1975. Sorry. Yeah. You're yeah. talking about the yeah. 1975. Yeah. The big shift. In the history of Islam. Yeah. yeah. Probably. In the, yeah. Pro but yeah. Most, in, in, uh, unbelievable. And what kind of leadership? Like, if you're just like, yeah, we're Sunni Muslim now, the whole squad is like, all right, cool. So, we're Sunni Muslim now. Again. I love this, but but how does that gotta, work? Yeah, but I'm yeah, saying because you, you, this started because you were saying literally you would have this massive convention massive going convention on in Chicago, in Chicago, in mm Chicago, -hmm. in the home in city Chicago, of Imam Warthi Muhammad. Muhammad. And yet, I remember. I mean, to their credit, like the leadership from the stage would even mention it for sure. But yet, yeah. there was this like disconnect or dissonance, if you will, where it was like they acknowledge that it's happening, and they're talking about how they went over there and they had lunch or whatever, but I'm like. <laughs> But yo, the the dis like the disconnect and the dissonance in the fact that yet it remains a separate and distinct convention in a separate and someone, distinct community and community. Just can someone explain to me why that that is just the way? And, we, and is that still the case? Is that still happening on Labor Day weekend? No, no. I think there was a few. I'm not sure. After, I haven't heard anything after his after his passing. Yeah, you know they had they had the convention okay. last in two years. They do have a convention, so it's still the same yeah, weekend. And everything. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of imams from our inner cities that do. Um, that was the, I, I, I attended that more than I attended Islam. So that has not been resolved, that like the fact that it's on no. the same weekend. I mean, what is there to resolve? I mean, now it's right. going to be like, well, nobody really comes to these big conventions. It's like, hey, yeah. you want to join? So why don't people, I think, I think back then there was a, le a level again is of, of this giant networking. And, and, you know, we were an isolated community. We all came from, I think, a sense of immigration trauma. There was a sense of alienation that we haven't, this was sort of our, this real, I, this was really a dopamine hit. It was. Yeah, I mean, that's how like, I. Yo, these are all these Muslims. Like I've never seen this many Muslims before. There was that, and I mean, I'll be I'll be honest. I mean, for me, it put people on my radar that never would have been at sure. my on my radar. Like I think we were talking about this, or you mentioned this on air, where it was like, okay, you heard Sheikh Hamza, like it'd be like an annual event because you'd hear him at Isna, and then you wouldn't ever hear him again. Uh, until the following is, until the unless following. you lived in the Bay Area, unless you were right. lucky like Omar or something, who had the opportunity to do that right here locally. But for the vast majority of us, right? Yeah. But I mean, and I, I've said this on the show. I mean, Sheikh Hamza hits my radar or comes across my radar at the '94 Isna convention. But he's one of several. People. But that's a heck of an introduction, right? Oh, it is. Like, but I mean, that space. to be fair, Imam Siraj, Imam Siraj, uh, Jamal Badawi, Doctor Jamal Badawi, Badawi uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and Doctor Ahmed Sakhar, Doctor Ahmed Sakhar, Allah yeah. Yeah. Do, do you want to do you want to quickly touch on before we go? I want because I do want to get back to his yeah, story. Yeah, do you want to yeah, quickly yeah, exactly. touch on uh, what we were talking about, which was these conventions becoming much smaller in in demand, I guess, or in scope? Well, yeah, and I what mean, the root I've, cause of that is, and kind of what you, you so, were saying about how that parallels that parallels the Hollywood a little yeah. bit. <laughs> Just touch right? on that real quick, Look, and then we'll get back to the first, kind of his story. The first thing yeah. is it's not lost on us at all when we talk about sort of the iteration of Islam in the United States right now. There's a lot of pageantry around it, and there's a performance based. Yeah preaching performative Islam. performative Islam that's not lost maybe that's what we need I'm not bashing on it I think it lacks depth at times if it doesn't move some to something else there was always charisma in our religion there was always been leaders that sort of move people's hearts mm -hmm. but there was always this idea of like a performance-based speaking or public speaking or just a little bit of pageantry sometimes that right it's sometimes sometimes like even even for me coming here, there's like a, you have so many books your thing and this, whatever, right? Like it's, oh, okay, uh, infotainment, like, I mean, are we talking about that kind of? Like, infotainment, that's a good, infotainment, edutainment. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just preaching, man. I mean, yeah, it is. It it's is just preaching. the art of preaching. No, no, you're right. It's you're just right. preaching. Right. Which has always been, you had the charismatic, like you said, you had the charismatic preacher, mm -hmm. but then you, and then you had the. You had the Fakhri Narazis. Exactly. You had the scholastic. Or scholastic, these right. powerful people that can move an entire crowd right. whenever they wanted to. And then you also had these like Qadi Abu Bakr al Arabi, who's just a jurist. He's just like sort of like, yeah, I'm not much of a preacher. I'm just a jurist. Yeah. Like, I'm just a great jurist. That's what I mean. Right? Yeah. So we've always had We've that. always had this. This is part of the human right. ex you know, experience. Yeah, sure, sure. So go back to your point. So, so you, uh, I think back. So it, pageantry, when you look performative at, Islam. When uh -huh. you look at. Hollywood, mm -hmm. right? There was a time, there was a time where there was a superstardom. This is mystique around seeing Frank Sinatra, around seeing Spencer Tracy, right? Or Steve McQueen, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was this larger than life. You only saw them at the silver screen. You never saw them on the street. You don't know what they ate for breakfast. You don't know what, you know, <laughs> what their workout routine was. Yeah. Yeah. And, but then, and that went through 
the early the two the two thousand. I mean, you're talking I, about basically I, until Twitter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Until Twitter, yeah. 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 It's sort of and all Schwarzenegger that, and, and all these yeah. cats, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, for sure. For you saw this level of like when we found out. I remember like when Oceans came out. Yeah, people yeah. were just like this all star cast because we're never going to see them outside of this. There's only time you're going to see these like seven powerhouses yeah. together. Which I mean, which was the Frank Sinatra film as well. I was about to say, right? you, you mentioned with the Sinatra pack. Oh, with the, the rap packs pack together, right? That's right. And everybody's going to come and, and, and see it. Okay. Where these people, men and women, mm-hmm. like the great, even like, you know, Grace Kelly, mm-hmm. their name on a poster, well, you, don't know about, you don't need to know anything about the movie. Their they name on tickets, a poster yeah. was enough. But I like that. I like yeah. the idea of the mystique. There's a mystique. Okay. Now, so likewise, there was a mystique around these wonderful dynamic speakers okay. that we had in the Muslim community, mm. right? You never really saw them at their homes. You mm. never saw them in your community at times. There were not, few of them were giving like the Fajr Halaqa. You, they were sort of, in one of the, ir- the irony is, they were not known in their local communities at times, mm-hmm. but they were known in these natural platforms. Right. But the locals would not know who they are, right? Their own community was sort of not who they are. There is a sheikh in, in our, very few people, for example, know that I would say that in our community, know that Dr. Amor is from the suburbs of Chicago. Like, mm. he lives in the suburbs of Chicago. Like, mm-hmm. if you, he just goes to the regular masjid mm. as an attendee at times, mm. right? Mm. Um, even, like even my experience in the Bay Area in the early 2000s, I lived in Santa Clara, San Jose area. Mm-hmm. And that crowd didn't really know that Sheikh Hamza was in Hayward. The Hayward folks, the folks who happened to already know about Zaytuna Institute on 631 mm-hmm. Jackson went regularly and there's a kind of a, a crew sure. and then their their friends that they looped in but it was like you had to kind of be in the know to go to that to site. go to that to yeah. that was, but yeah. the vast majority of the guy who was working at cisco who moved here from pakistan to work at cisco in 2001 had no had clue no idea that sheikh hamza he might have heard his or any of these, too, yeah he had no idea that there was a there this was, was a the thing you know exactly yeah i mean and even even a lot of it was sort of there's also this rahmatullahi ahmed did that hype at the time as well where it was sort of this like wild and out rap battle <laughs> at times because it was like this sort of we won we finally have somebody which i look i understand it oh yeah we finally yeah. have somebody that you can stick it to the, the people charm. that have yeah and and can and can knock somebody out proverbially this is off the heels of the only champion that we had mm-hmm. in america was Muhammad Ali, mm-hmm. and it was a physical knockout. And that what that did, the ripple effect of him yeah. knocking somebody out yeah, yeah, yeah. and calling Muhammad the champion mm-hmm. was something that was we all celebrated. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, and mm-hmm. and I think that that we, we, you know, we were really riding the coattails of that. Okay. Yeah. And then now, when you yeah. move in, I think similarly as we don't really have a superstar in Hollywood anymore. Yeah. You'll never see Michael. Look, dude. Okay, here's an example. Last yeah. Dance comes out. Yeah. It's the most watched doc sports documentary ever yeah. because you never see Michael Jordan anywhere else. You yeah. never have vulnerable conversation with Michael Jordan. You ever hear talk about his feelings? Nobody saw him cry <laughs> except for that crying meme. Like nobody saw <laughs> yeah. Michael Jordan talk about, uh, you know, yeah. his, uh, even though there was obviously probably a lot of exaggeration in the documentary itself was yeah. clearly, you know, very conducted, but like. And very favorable. To and very, very favorable to him. Yeah. Uh, to, to him. But, but it did, feel, on, it did feel very high, mis- like, wow, I get to see, hear these things behind the scenes I never got to heard before. The, these before. lost footage, yeah. right? Yeah. The lost footage yeah. of yeah. the Bulls. Yeah. Likewise, um, when you look at sort of this modern sort of celebrity culture, yeah. it doesn't, you sort of see them every single day. Yeah. You know what they're eating for breakfast. Uh, they say I, t- I tell my daughter, I tell my daughter, because she's a big Swifty, <laughs> and I tell her, just remember... Taylor Swift doesn't dress like she does on stage at home because you've seen her in her sweatpants and pajamas. So, yeah. so that's like how I kind of uh, remind her to, 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 you know, that, hey, t- even Taylor Swift doesn't, doesn't dress like she does on stage, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, but but it's, a, it's a serious it point. It's like she's a real person. She's a real person. Sweatpants, There's this reality right? around these yeah. people, right? Um, but it, so it, do you think this is, it's a negative? Because yeah, our kids' well, generation positive. don't have, they, on one hand, they don't have that big event to look forward to or I'm, that I'm, yeah, scholar I'm to trying fall. to understand on what you're, like, what the hypothesis is that you're I think, proposing. I think the, 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 well, the hypothesis To answer Omar's is, question, right? I mean, look, which is... The, like, the, make a judgment on it. We want to hear your the judgment The judgment on is, it. one thing, I think the negative at times, you know, the, the Messenger of Allah says that, لا تقوم الساعة حتى كل ما عجبون رأيهم And the hour won't come until everybody's impressed by their own opinion. There's a lot, there's, there, the p- punditry has usurped scholarship at times. So I think you start to see these this mass access to voices that are not doing justice to their communities, nor is there a focus on nurturing and building. Look, whatever we say about the these people that we had before us, they built a community. 
Sure. They had these intimate relationships with this community that they had uh, nurtured and they had taught and they have taken in. Now it's so digitalized that everybody's m- are really focused on putting content like Netflix puts out content and that's it. I mean, and that's in the buck sort of stops there. I mean, let's be real. I mean, no. we have just like you have an, I mean, you, you have, you have Muslim influencers. I mean, that's like literally their just claim a, to yeah. claim to fame. I'm an, I'm a Muslim influencer content creators straight up like that what do you do i'm a content creator yeah like these are now like job titles i, I so actually i'm saying it's, it's as common you know i'm what i'm saying is the muslim community is not inoculated or immunized from what's happening in the broader culture yeah and what you see is a flat you, you also see a flattening of of expertise For there's sure. no hierarchy anymore it's just this flattening because of you know brother x can speak with as much of a um of a megaphone as can you know scholar exactly. why so the hypothesis as you asked is Thank if you. you've read if you've read civilization on trial which mm-hmm. is 120 here are two really good books that i like right is civilization on trial which i think is a series of essays and something called um a historian's approach to religion which okay. i like a lot and in both of those he argues that at, at times and i believe he probably got this from like ibn khaldun or something Toynbee was clearly very, like mm-hmm. i think that that when a, a people who are defeated or who has has what's called a like they've been colonized yes they fight or the values or the systems of the colonizer, but subconsciously only with the framework that the colonizer provides. Mm. So you're working within the system, whether you like it or not. That's the right. fact that you've, you're using this modality, oh, you've already lost. It's there over. The there conversation is over. Mm-hmm. So that the point of this is like, I don't think, like you said, we're, it's this, this system that we're trying to fight and we try to other us ourselves from, yeah. we're not innocuous, like from, no. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it's not some innocuous movement. It's already here. Right. And the fact that we're using these sort of adawats, these sort of tools, and we just cut, copy, paste, um, whatever this system that we're trying to otherwise is doing, I think we're so blind from that at times, right? Yeah. But we've been, we've been having a hard time thinking if we can be indigenously Muslim in America and be this cultural phenomenon here and have some sort of, a, even a little bit of, a little bit of love for our people, our nation, Mm -hmm. that was under question for the longest time. Mm -hmm. But it was still under question with the same process in which we were defeated by. Sure. Right? Wow. It's just a really interesting Ah. paradox. I I think, I I definitely think the idea of separating like content creation from true scholarship, that's, I think most people would agree that that's been more negative. I think the idea of, could we give the next generation that pageantry I think there is something lost there by not offering that pageant. I'll give you another basketball metaphor. When there was a Muslim basketball player in the 90s, everybody rooted for all the Muslim kids were like, wow. Darko Wahid on Dallas, wasn't it? Yeah, Darko Wahid. 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 Uh, By the way, he lives here. That's a story. We'll talk to you about that. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, Mahmoud Darko Wahid. Wait, he lives here? Why why haven't we had him on the show? Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll tackle that. We'll (laughs) we'll discuss. on, (laughs) on On Atlanta? Uh, uh, Sharif, yeah, Sharif, Sharif Abdurrahim. Yeah. Abdurrahim. So Abdurrahim. I, I, Abdurrahim. See how right. fast I'm spouting, uh, spitting out these names yeah. because those people had like profound, like wow impact, yeah. the pageantry effect on me. Right, kids now, oh, yeah. they can be like proud of their deen, proud of their Islam, but they're like, yeah, I'm not really a big fan of such and such Muslim player because there's like ten of them, and yeah. they're like whatever. Like so, th- that's exactly. been wa- that impacts, but that pageantry impact has been watered down. Mm. Me personally, as a parent, I'm like, man, it'd be nice if our kids kind of had that event to look forward to that we could take into that will have that dopamine hit on them that we had or that person they can look up to that they'll just like really really want to follow or or there is i think there is but what i know you have like like steven jackson i remember when he came to our community was like packed house i think hearing jalen brown say dua in the playoffs that hits home for a lot of people we can never deny that like everybody tweets about it everybody's writing about there is a little bit of that i guess and my only pushback to omar's point about uh, my thing is is that i guess i question the very possibility of that occurring to 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 our kids generation because they are so desensitized that's my point and uh, and what i'm saying is it's overload just like the just like co- streaming content is overload and yeah. we and you know i kind of missed just the tom cruise movie which you know <laughs> speaking of mission but i think there's something when it comes to like kids they need that like wow that dopamine hit they need that like pageantry as you yeah. call it they need that person to look up to that's not their parents that they want to be like who's a good role model all that feels to be watered down and i me as a parent or looking at the next generation i'm like mm, something there's something 
lost missing there. Right. There's, lost. Something There's, lost. Something lost. There's something lost on that yeah. generation or on this generation. Cool. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I wrestle with that. So I mean, like, I mean, I, I, I think I was the, uh, maybe a little the earlier um, guinea pigs to that ex- thought experiment. In what sense? In the sense is I, I wasn't attached to these conventions after that at all. Okay, so how? Right. So that's so, a perfect segue. <laughs> yeah. Right. Perfect segue. It, it so is. this, how did you then overcome, mm-hmm. quote unquote, overcome? Because it felt like maybe that was the standard way to go uh, in the nineties. How? What led you to find a connection? Yeah. If you didn't it, have it, the attachment, what, to the yeah. events was it an and ep- so forth? Was it a moment of epiphany? Was it a pro? Was it a process? And then, of course, then. I would love for you to then take us to your own sort of religious the training. Training, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that sort of begins. I mean, my first is like, my mom puts me in like a summer Quran program. Uh, in Chicago. In Chicago. It was just because she was like, oh, you need, to, you need to have some identity of like, so she puts me in the Quran program. It was great. I'm, gra- I'm really grateful for it now. And I think then sort of, that was in like middle school. Mm. And then I did, you know, I didn't, my father moved for work. So I didn't see him that much, especially my like freshman and sophomore year of high school. Okay. By this point, you know, we, my mom and me go back to visit my grandparent, my grandfather, because he passed, he's like, there's like an angioplasty in the family. Mm. And then we come, we're back in the States and now I'm like just a regular high school boy. Okay. Um, doing everything. I played basketball in high school. I Like for the team. For yeah, the school yeah, for team. school, for high school. I, I, I was really like involved in like those activities until I think maybe junior year. Um, I had to do some community service stuff, which I'm not going to get into why, but I had to do community service. Were you a bad little boy in A school? No, 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 no. I was, okay, it wasn't okay. that bad. Okay, okay. It was, it was, it wasn't, was it was like a, <laughs> I was like a high school, like, it was like a, like playground high school fight yeah. situation, right? Got it, got where it. things, you know, you know, you want to check an adab of a Muslim, you uh-huh. see how they play ball. Because that's where adab hits the, all adab goes out the window when you have Muslims playing basketball together. That's when like their real, you know, true colors come out. That's hilarious. Right? Uh, <laughs> so, you, man, I have... <sighs> You just reminded me, sorry, I, this is mm-hmm. maybe a little bit of a tangent, but I have like archival, like for me, it's like archival footage now, <laughs> is how I would describe it. Funny. But I have footage of, I guess I'll just name names, but it's like, I have, I have footage of like Dr. Jackson and uh, uh, Imam Siraj playing one-on-one basketball. Oh, that's And great. Dr. Jackson is the biggest trash talker you would have ever met on the court in your life <laughs> that's hilarious it is hilarious that's hilarious and imam siraj is so like, imam siraj like shopping. played for like saint john's in uh, a, a college in in new york so in new york so he's a baller i'll, I'll throw i'll throw a funny uh, another one out i don't think i ever told you about this i have a picture of <laughs> sheikh muhammad yakubi shooting hoops with us that's amazing <laughs> that's great yeah. you know what i want to do and, 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 and i i, I will like this has become like a side project of mine i haven't even told you but yeah. i, I want to dig into your archival yeah. photos and videos as well but i want to i want to put some of this content on like our patreon, yeah, yeah, we'll on our that. patreon page mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, or something sure. where people can access it if they're patrons of the show yeah because i have like i was just going through like i was rummaging through some photographs because i wanted to take like i want to scan them for my Chicago trip because I'm connecting with some old friends mm-hmm. and I wanted to just, you know, I was having like a, like whatever, moments of nostalgia. So it was like, I, I, have, I have all these scanned photographs now that I'm going to sh- share with my friends when I see them in Chicago. I found all these gems of like, like the, what I described, you know, Dr. Jackson yeah. and Imam Siraj playing basketball, you know, in a, in a very kind of just, yeah, very away from the microphones, away from the... It's very you know, human, yeah, natural yeah, moments. Yeah, yeah, with yeah totally. But anyway, sorry, you were so saying yeah, so about... So, I mean, I that, that's all that happens. And then I end up go yeah. looking up online and, you know, we're living, we live, we're in the west side of Chicago at this point. And I end up going, I spend a lot of time in like a place called Garfield Park, Chicago, and in the south side of Chicago. That's sort of where oh. I have more of my formative years. Now, this is, I think this is like my upbringing begins here. Real what takes upbringing. you to... But I mean, the first it, one is I just had a lot of community service and like... We lived not too far. We lived 15 minutes away. Oh. Um, yeah, 15, 20, 20. So at that time, yeah. What suburb was this? Um, so this you... was like from the highway to the spot was was Westmont, Illinois. Okay. And I go to, I, I go there and there's a brother who's passing out food and making sandwiches. And he looks like a young Jared Butler. Young <laughs> Jared Butler. And I'm like, oh, who's this guy? He goes, assalamu alaikum. Wasn't welcome. This is Mike Swice. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And he's like a fresh convert to Islam making I never saw the butter. young Jared Butler until you just yeah. that. I was like, yeah, I was like, this is this is him, right? Yeah. And he's just but he's happy all the time, right? He's Up. making sandwiches. Yeah. And we're in this place called Icky's Park, which it doesn't exist anymore, I don't believe. Or it's no yeah, it's just been an old housing project. And then he gives me a, a ride home 
and this like you know the the quintessential like a pedophile van you know the white pedophile <laughs> vans because he has a he has one of these vans and he's this elder i'm in high school and he's like yeah i'll give you a ride home Bitch, hop in <laughs> i'm like okay <laughs> but he's and then after that he would sort of became like and and so this is weird things so well this is happening and i still sort of i'm still part of like my my friends in school and things like yeah. that but weirdly enough somehow he becomes like my closest friend wow. i start spending more time with him because he starts picking me up from my house he's like hey i'm going to this place called garfield park okay there's a masjid there called masjid dawa and it's on the west side of chicago it's big now but the mosque itself was just your living this living room yeah, back then and maybe the living room that i remember was a mosque the mm -hmm. whole masjid mm -hmm. and i went there and he would go there every single i mean this dude allah bless him man he was already doing grassroots work but either se sometimes 70 people would come out and only three people come out but he'd always be there buying own pocket, buying masa trolley, King making sandwiches, sandwiches and just passing out food and doing things for the community. Now, when this happens, uh, the masjid is a jama'at tabliq masjid that is a black tabliqi jama'at masjid. Okay. Over there, I get interested. The imam becomes my first. I sat in one class and I go to the imam there and I just think he's a regular imam. And I was like, hey, I want to learn like the Quran and I want to learn. I want to learn uh, Arabic. And he said, okay, come after Fajr every single day. I was like, okay, how about like five times a day, five times a week? Yeah. He's like, okay, yeah, no problem, whatever. And this imam is a son of a great Sudanese sheikh. His name is Imam Badruddin Hafid from Sudan. And he's uh, an incredibly traditional gentleman. And he comes and he starts to sort of to teach. He has his own, like, it's really, really quirky Sudanese tendencies, but knows a lot. And he becomes my Quran teacher. And I joined like a Hivith program with them. And we just spent... Tons of times memorizing the Quran. Like, that was it. All and you're in high on. school at this time? Yeah, I'm in 11th grade. I don't know anything about anything right now. All I know is Quran and Arabic and a few different conversations that I'm just part of, obviously, being around mm. this community. And what, But what was the real motivation to get you interested? Yeah. You That's, I never really thought of that. I think A was just like, was hey if i'm gonna if i'm gonna commit to this thing i better know something so there wasn't any mo was this was arabic no arabic had a motive to it okay. arabic specifically arabic sure. it wasn't arabic did because i there was something about arabic that i saw that it brought some dignity in the way people speak and the way people behave i saw arabs speak in that mosque like african arabs speak in that mosque East African speak, and when they would speak Fusha, they would literally stand up straight. Like it, their posture would change, mm. right? Their hands would move differently. Their uh, what's called their talafud, which is their ability to enunciate. Right. And that became this like, wow, man, these these people have like some sense of worth, right? And there's a there's this weird sense of dignity that I saw in speaking about religion that I didn't see before. Mm. Where before it was sort of like the undignified, we talked about it before, the sort of, you know, oh, you're a little more, you're older, you're regressed, you're a little, you know, the, the, your tendencies are not as updated. But these people were all smart and they were like, not just mashaykh or scholars, they were like engineers and doctors and, and entrepreneurs. And then you had, and, but this was in an inner city mosque, and you had, you know, brothers coming out of, of, from, from the inner city. And at that time, the only thing that I think was a little difficult for me is like reconciling being with my friends who are not Muslim. My two best friends were not Muslim. Okay. And probably the only mistake I made is distancing, distancing myself. Mm. It's like, hey guys, I can't really hang out anymore because you guys are like not Muslim. Mm. Right. right. But that's just how it was yeah. at the so, time. I'm sorry, the, like the point you just made kind of, I, I missed the point that you said, like about, yeah, no, the, this, the, the, like. The catalyst to studying? No, 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 no. I mean, just the, literally the point you just made about like how Islam was presented to you and what was different about mm -hmm. the, this particular Sudanese, for example, Quran mm -hmm. teacher. So like, what was different? Like you, you said there was like sort of a dignity you mentioned. Yeah. What was lacking, well, I guess, prior to that in the personalities that you encountered at the mosque? So it was, it was uh, a, I think everybody wanted to be there. That okay. was the first. Like, everybody actually wanted to be... Like, this became a community space. Like, people would just come sleep in the mosque. Mm. People and that was would lacking. play Uno in the mosque. People, I'm serious. <laughs> right. People would just yeah, play yeah. Uno in the mosque. And, like, people would talk about how 9-11 was a giant conspiracy in the mosque. Like, that was, like, all the halakas. Right? Because it was, like, all these movies that came out on YouTube. Like, I remember there was a brother who would just sit outside and be like, Ah, you gotta know the haq. Right? <laughs> you gotta know the haq. You gotta put the haq in your brain. Ah, this yeah. is real. They're coming right. after us. Right. And we like, I just realized like, oh, this is our community. Like we have right. these scholars, we have quirky and, people, we have the eccentrics Sure. and everybody just sort of 
dealt with each other. And that was lacking in some of the other immigrant mosques that you had sort of, you know, attended even sparingly, but mm -hmm. attended in the past? Yeah, maybe. I think there okay. was a sense of like social schizophrenia at times when I had entered those mosques uh -huh. where you were in the masjid where there's an adab of a mosque. Nobody's saying there's no adab etiquette of a mosque, but there was also like you were in the mosque, real more tight. You just prayed. The sheikh was there. You thought, you never really had this like strong relationship with them. The question was always like, did you listen to music or not? And that was like the bar for how committed you are to this thing. Mm -hmm. right. Where when I'm in like this space, or if you space, ate zebiha meat, well, yeah, uh, any of the not, any of the yeah. the usual suspects, <laughs> and you know, in in all of these preconditions and pre qualifiers sure. to being a member of your community. Got it. And I think over here, you just had, I saw a level of, I think, sincerity of people just wanting to be, yeah, you had the, it was weird because you had like, you had that one uncle in this community too was like, what are you doing here? Like, because men and women would come and serve food and those one brother would come and be like, this is inappropriate, inappropriate right? Yeah. But the fact that you had an imam was like, all right, cool, inshallah, jazakallah khair for your nasiha. And he just had our, he just had our back, right? Interesting. It was like yeah, really yeah, cool yeah, to see that it. he's like, this is not a big deal. It. Like, like, you know, do you know, I'll give you an example. Do you know Lil Dirk? Mm -hmm. He's a rapper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, his father was like, he used to come to the masjid. Mm. Right? I mean, th this is like... It's outside. Lupe, this, it's outside. Lupe used to roll through this mosque at times once or twice, you know? Like these people, nobody knew. It was not Nobody's like, heard of Lupe recently on Twitter. I, like. I don't know what happened. I heard something, <laughs> but I haven't I haven't heard about... I don't want to go there. But I don't anyway, know what it is. Yeah, but at that yeah, time, yeah. it was like, it was, again, this, way, this is way back. Yeah, yeah. And people are aware of this, of, of this, of this space. But I used to come there all of the time. And I just became like this, the Sheikh student. He used to run errands. You know, he was also, he was a Sheikh, he was an Imam and he was taking care of the community. Like, by, like he was like, okay, this person needs food. This person needs uh, this, whatever. They're like a checklist and he would just go collect it. And he was an engineer as well, which this is like a middle, it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous neighborhood, especially that time. But it was Madison used to be, the, Madison Street used to be the, back in the 70s, uh, the 50s, 60s, 70s, Madison was the Michigan Avenue for all intents and purposes, or, or equivalent to the Michigan Avenue of Chicago. The, the United Center is called the Madhouse on Madison. Oh. Right? So if you go to Madison all the way down, you get to Garfield Park. In the middle of it, there's a, there's a place called the Garfield Park Conservatory that's incredibly famous because it has Moroccan mosaic architecture all over it, which is a weird foreshadowing. But why do you say foreshadowing? Because where do I end up going? Um, oh. So I'm past this Moroccan. Okay, okay. And I mean, it's an Instagram now. Like I think, like teenage, like Muslim girls go there to take their Instagram pictures. A I lot see, of them in couples, right. but they just go there, take the picture, and sort of leave because you shouldn't really hang out around that neighborhood too long. Uh. It's one of the ones have. It's a. I, I think there, there was a point where it had the most amount of shootings. In okay. Chicago, bar none, at but some point. You mentioned this kind of Moroccan uh, sort of architecture. Chicago has a lot of these really interesting... Intercontinental. Right. Yeah, There's they have the, the dome. Intercontinental. You have the Medina building. Medina building. Uh, which is right. was a Bloomingdale's at one point. Bloomingdale. It still is. It yeah, still it is says, La Ghalib Allah all yes. around the building. Yes, it does. There's no conquer but God yeah. all around the building. Because yeah. it was used to be a Masonic lodge. It used to be a Masonic yeah, lodge, that's yeah, right. Yeah. So um, anyway, Chicago does stuff. have a very strong it does. history it does. with all of that. Right. So... This this sorry. over occurs. So what I'm hearing you say, sorry. Oh, actually, finish your point because I'm trying to unpack also Omar's question about, like, I, so I'm I'm kind of I want to ask the next question with that kind okay. of a background. Uh, that's how I'm approaching okay. it. But finish You're, your point ask, first. Ask your question, then he can finish his point yeah. and answer question. Okay, sure. So what I'm hearing you say then is that in your case at least there was less this sort of moment of epiphany that happens that leads to a religious reconnection in your life. A recollection in your life, right? I don't know if you remember, but Talif used to have a project, Recollect. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is early Talif. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. we're going to get to Talif too later. You have this recollection where it's like you're, you're, you're reconnecting with your faith. In your case, at least, what I'm hearing you say, it was less this sort of moment of epiphany, but rather it was just this like this process. Your mom sent you to Sunday, like your mom sent you to Quran school. You sort of continue. So it almost seems like to me, yeah. what what works in your case is tried and true engagement with the tradition in some capacity and it's it's like the prayer it's like the five daily prayers it's, it's like, an it's, organic also it's organic it's and, organic and not every prayer is going to lead it's to not like a, a light bulb moment look, aha right moment. look but it's, it's just, just doing the prayer daily daily the and routine day out, that's right that, that eventually is, gonna, is going to have its effect 
Exactly. You know, وَمَا تَقَدَّمُ الْخَيْرِ إِلَّا أَنفُسُكُمْ تَجُدُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَخَيْرُ وَعَدَمَ الْأَجْرُ Like Allah says in the Quran, like you don't do good except you present it for yourself and that is the greatest and mightiest rewards. The Mufassirin, one of the things they say about this is that means that when you're in these, when you're engaging in these actions of ritualistic things, there's one of them I feel like they have this high spiritual maqam, right. this tendency, this station, this feeling. But it may be the one that you do as a chore, mm -hmm. has, has, just because you do it, because you've taken your feelings out of the way, and you're just doing it because God told you to do it, that might have immense openings that you've never been able to imagine, right? right? That has its own fruits to it. Well, let's even start before I'm doing this because God told me to do it. I'm seeing, again, from the perspective of a father, right? Mm -hmm. My daughter's like, I'm doing this just because my parents made me do yeah. it. There's but something special about that. That's what, see, and I think that, and this is where I think generation, like Gen X has failed as parents. Because we aren't willing to subject subject our kids to that level of discomfort. This is a great point. Boomers, Bo yeah, our parents, they, they, they didn't mind taking off the kid gloves and hard knock school, man. 100%. Day in and day 100%. out. Oh, you're uncomfortable? Suck it up. Do your hizbiv, whatever. That's like, right. And they didn't have like, if you ask them aqidah, they'd be like, no, if you totally. Ask them, they wouldn't know any of that stuff. No. There was a level of, which was really Man. interesting. This was a huge part. It's like, and no matter what experience, cultural or otherwise, religious, spectrum religiosity or not, the th God was never under threat. Hmm. Like, God was never under threat. There was no way, even like our families that didn't come from totally active, engaged Muslims. That's right. You never mentioned anything bad about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah. It was game over, no matter exactly. what. Exactly. You could drink alcohol day in and day out. But if you ever mentioned something about the Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their blood would boil. I And I talked about this uh, on the last episode with Adnan and Zulfiqar, because we were talking about this this idea of, you know, where we make Islam so, well, anyway, like, regardless of the specific point we were be making, but I, I, I mentioned this idea of where growing up for the first maybe 10 years of my life, I refer to God as Allah Mia. Like, it's this very intimate, or you, I don't know if it's yeah, very do common. Yeah, the right? yeah. It's, it's Allah Mia is the way we, I refer to God probably the first 10 years of my life. So to, going back to your point of aqidah and, you know, there was never, it was never that, but it was this sort of intimate, loving Right. With, with God, uh, with, with companionship Allah. with God. Right. And like you said, uh, saying anything less than you know, favorable, favorable yeah. or of res out of respect, deep respect for the Quran or the prophet, game over. Game over. Yeah. It was game over. And that's yeah. what I mean. And so, but I'm saying this is where we, I think we have failed as Gen sure, X. Sure, sure. Where not only have we not inculcated in our children that basic sort of like adab, that basic, uh, you know, relationship with Allah, with the book, with his Rasul, but also going back to the point I just made about how we're not willing to subject our kids to that level. And I, cause I saw you to kind that, of light to up that level. to that level yeah. of d sort of discomfort. Yeah. I mean, it's a story of like when, uh, Imam Maluk's mother sends him to Rabi'a to study. Okay. And in the first day he comes back, she said, Ma like, what did yeah. you learn? Yeah. He's the ilm al adab. Yeah. Like I learned knowledge and I learned etiquette, yeah. manners. He said, you didn't learn anything. Second day, what did you learn? I learned knowledge and I learned etiquette. So what did you mean? Nothing. Third day, she said, he said, what did you learn today? He said, I learned, to adab al -ilm. I learned etiquette and I learned knowledge. He said, now you've begun learning. Mm. Now, because that adab and that etiquette was like, a prerequisite. as a prerequisite to everything. Because all of our knowledge is an attempt to articulate adab with God and adab with the Prophet and adab with the creation of God. That's all our knowledge really is. Wait. Fifth is an articulation of adab. In so this is why I love. Okay, about <laughs> repeat that because that that needs to be that that needs to be repeated. All of our knowledge that we seek yes. is an attempt to properly ad articulate adab with God, His Messenger, and in the people around us. That's what all of our knowledge really comes down to. It's an articulation of etiquette. It reminds me of something Dr. Jackson said years and years ago that changed my life. And he was talking specifically about the Quran, but and this is kind of relevant to what we were talking about earlier. The Quran is not about information; it's about transformation. Mm. Right. There's a lot of information in there, yeah, but that's it, not its purpose. Yeah. I, I think that's brilliant. That's actually yeah. that's I'm, I'm just pondering that because <laughs> yeah. if you think about any relationship, let's just say you're going through marriage yeah. marriage counseling, sure. the counseling, the knowledge, the tools you're getting, that's the knowledge. Ultimately, you're trying to breed love, mm. mercy, rahmah in the marriage, right? Yeah. It's the same concept. It's about the it's about the relationship, more about the tools to get there. There right. you go. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, yeah. exact. I'll give you a really example of where we've sort of failed in this. There was a brother that came to our space, and his mother came to complain. And she said, "What are you guys doing?" He was a young brother that sort of, um, you know, probably clicked on the right YouTube link and all of a sudden had an epiphany and became incredibly religious. And she was like, "You know, in our culture, we stand up when we mean our elders, 
But now he starts to, he stopped and I asked him why. He said, this is all an innovation. This is not from the book in the Sunnah. Right, right. Right? That's the start of it. Guys, that's where it starts. It's like, bro, what do you, <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's your non-negotiable. Yeah. <laughs> that's the sword you're willing to fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is this lack of just, you know, under, having this deep sense of etiquette. And it, it's even, and even fiqh, but you know that story of the man that prayed after, you can't pray after Asr, Salat al-Asr. Right. And a man prayed. Is that across the schools? I know in the Hanafis uh, is very strict about yeah, it. Yeah, strict right? Malikis are incredibly oh, strict okay, about okay, it too. Okay, you can't okay. pray any no, 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 no sajda after. No sajda after 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 Asr. Right, yeah. yeah. And a man does pray, and they ask Imam. They told Imam Ali, said, you know, can you go stop him? Yeah. And he was about to, and he remembers the word Al yanha abdan idha salla. Do you do you see the one that stops you from praying when the servant prays, which was about Abu Jahl when he went to stop the Prophet, and he said, no, I'm not going to stop him. Like let him pray. I'll talk to him later. Like that type of nuanced yeah. adab and etiquette right. that you learn about things. And I, and I can tell you a story once. Um, can I fast forward a little bit? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're jumping all over, so just, it's okay. Just, just fast forward a little bit. It, this helped me a lot because mind you, like, even though the epiphany, the organic nature was, I was, I was already reading Martin Luther before I started to like, at like eight, when I was in eighth grade. <laughs> Like I was already reading, yeah, yeah Saint Thomas Aquinas. And Ain't a lot of eighth graders reading Thomas Aquinas, yeah. sir, or or or, or, or Martin Luther. <laughs> I, I I did like I was always into this stuff. I read the auto. I think that by that point, yeah. I've read the autobiography of Malcolm X like four times. Wow. Already, and I already read Roots. Like I was just really into the stuff. The first, my parents are really kind of strange. They let me watch R-rated movies when I was a kid. R-rated? Yeah. Like yeah. like I was in fifth grade. My dad took me to Troy. And I was like, what's that? And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Yeah. I was in fifth grade, bro. Like I was right. in fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> like if like the cursing and violence was never a big that, deal in our family. Ridley Scott, I haven't seen Troy. No, Troy was horrible. It was Wolfgang yeah. Peterson. Yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> okay. Um, it was just it was like you just watched it for Brad Pitt and Hector. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hector right. He's fighting. Achilles, right? That was the only reason you watched okay. the film. Mm -hmm. But like because of he was an A lister. Remember he was an A lister. To your, to your point, so it was a garbage movie. Yeah, so exactly. you watch this A list film, right? Yeah. And the first film that I watched that like that I can remember was Malcolm X, right? That was the first yeah. film that I ever watched. Wow. I got a side question just <laughs> related to, do you think a kid would be confused by watching Malcolm X without any of that context? Because there's a lot of like, I mean, there's, the Nation of Islam has a lot of non-Sunni non yeah. teaching. Like, would that be confusing to somebody? I, I don't think so, because I think they actually did a really good job of, of defining and what, like sort of having this definitive moment. Reason being, the most moving part of that movie for me, other than all of the, was was the, that really cool hospital scene where brothers of brothers, remember that? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was really dope. The left, left, move to the yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, move yeah, to the left. Of course. But what was really inspiring for me looking back now yeah. was just seeing Denzel Washington in Ihram, mm -hmm. in yeah. Hajj. Oh, yeah. And doing Muzdalifa and doing the Rami. Same. I was like, this is insane. Even now it's insane. It is. Even now yeah. it's like, how are, did they, like, yeah. this and is then so powerful. They yeah. end that segment in the movie with him reciting Fatiha. Yeah, the Fatiha, remember that. Right. Yeah. They begin that segment with the Adhan, uh -huh. right? But they don't complete the Adhan because then, they, right, it starts they, in Egypt. Yeah. And, yeah. They, and they show the And you read, they read the letter. I believe right. Islam has a has the uh, the solution to race from America. Exactly. So I don't think it's that. No, so my question, I, I don't Sorry. think so. Yeah. And I would, argue, I would even venture to say that I think that, and I don't think this is what Omar meant, but, you know, I think presenting a less than sanitized version of, and the realities of people's lives, mm -hmm. especially some of our patron saints even, you know, is, is okay. Yeah. We yeah. need to, I think. Yes, yes. Because absolutely. people need to see not, only, not only where they They're ended up, now, right? but also the where they began. The, yeah. the, Turk, the Turks are doing it with their productions. Oh, yeah. You're well, right. I haven't seen things. a lot yeah, of those. I haven't seen them. Like, Ibn Arabi, they did yeah, one. Right, right. So, people are realizing the importance of it. You're I right. Think. That's a very um, good point. But at that point, remember, like, I'm, I'm all about... I, I was reading, uh, I think in high school, I had AP English, and I was reading... Um, uh, we were reading Death of a Salesman, yeah. Arthur Miller, and I got into a shouting match with my teacher. She hated me. <laughs> she hated me, and I think I won in, in that argument, and it burns me till this day. What was it about? That she would never exist. That why did this man feel like a failure? Yeah. Which was, Low I was, man. Yeah. Why did he feel like a failure? I uh -huh. said, because he lacked any spiritual purpose in his life that never gave him a sense of direction. She said, no, it was because he didn't provide for his kids. I was like, where do you think that comes from? Right? This is how I'm talking to her. No, Adab. I'm, I'm so upset at why, how does she not see this? Mm -hmm. Right? And I wrote um, the word arrogate 
you, we can't irrigate to ourselves. And she, she marked it off. She said, it's not a word. It's not a word. Yeah. And then, then I, I was like, yeah, you're my enemy. I don't like you. Like that was it. I'm just kidding. She was a great woman. She probably was like, well, you know, she, God bless her and give right. her the best. Um, uh, I celebrate her now. Um, right. But right. like. As often happens. But anyways, uh, I go, I, and now yeah. you juxtapose this to an experience that I had. I remember once. Uh, at the Qarawin, we only had, when I was there, we only had 20 kids in our graduating class. Okay. 2025. I came to class and we we're t- teaching Arabic and this, what, everybody sort of wore like a shirt, a pant, jilabia. I got late. I slept in a little bit. I came in with like track pants. Okay. And a t-shirt. Right. We're doing the, um, we're doing the class and the teacher looks at me sort of like sort of askance mm-hmm. every now and then. I'm like, what is he looking at? Like something wrong. End of the class, we're done. And we had about 45 minutes and he's like, hey, let your teacher take you to breakfast. So he takes me to breakfast and he starts to tell me stories about how like our scholars presented themselves, right? He's like, you know, it was amazing. I was a Sheikh Abdul Hayl Kittani and he would always whoop, uh, burn oud. Oh, he would, and he told me the story of Imam Malik, how he'd always burn incense. You know yeah. that story before he uh, relates the hadith, hadith. Right? right? He would always have the worst, the best clothes and burn and put oil on his skin mm-hmm. and how the Mashaykh so, uh, would never teach even grammar without their perfectly iron tur- turban he talked me about Sheikh Talidi may Allah have mercy on him and you know the Ghumari brothers all these stories and I realized I was like hold up he's telling me something he was like bro stop coming to class looking like a bum yeah. that's what he was saying mm-hmm. right? right of course and finally we're walking my class I was like Sheikh I, I heard what you said he said what do you mean I said you could have just told me you didn't need to buy me breakfast like I would have listened to and he said he said he said he told me لا تنصى أحدا غير إطعام he said never give anybody advice without feeding them first so like you start to learn this adab of like oh it was not about doing things right Eve, it was about he was teaching me etiquette with the process of etiquette and through etiquette mm. and i just thought that was a moment that i'll never you know it was so profound to me yeah. so i think that's what i saw um this idea of going, going back, back to, to like yeah. this this masjid is like oh like you were being fed and these people right. cared for you and people right. always ask how your family is my grandfather died my grandfather passed away you can ask my father this the whole masjid rolled through and just visited my dad mm. my dad was like who are, who these, are people? these people like why are these people in shalwar kurtas and in thobes and sudanese turbans like here and i was like oh dad this is imam badruddin he's like whatever they sat there they made dua for him and it was it was powerful to see the whole tribe right. come through and then there is an event that happens and the imam and Mike was like, hey, could you come in for this event? We need, they need help. There's an imam coming from California. <laughs> and he was like, we need to record it. Do you know anybody recorder? I said, my dad has a camcorder. So I was like, hey, dad, can I borrow a camcorder? Mm-hmm. He was like, no, what's it for? I said, oh, after to record some like Muslim thing, some speakers coming. I go there and uh, I set it up and I was just sitting there camera. I don't know how to use this camera by this point, right? Like, but there was this, there was just, I said, it did the best that I could. And in walks this like regal gentleman. He probably doesn't even remember this. There's no way he remembers this, but this regal gentleman, very, very tall. is Imam Zaid Shakir. Mm-hmm. And I heard my first real Islamic speech ever, right? And I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. Like this dude's rapping in the middle of it, like these beautiful rhymes. Uh, this is, uh, you know, every, like it was just, it was this energy that he brought with him. So I can't even say it was even, it wasn't even about the content. It was just his energy. That's right. And I say salam to him and um, like I'm looking up at him like, man, dude, this is really cool. Like, like this is really awesome. What and year is this? 2009 or something like that. Oh, nine, oh, 10, maybe 2009. Yeah. And I have it. I have to look for it. I actually have that talk. Okay. Um, I want to digitize it. Right. Because I, I know I recorded over an old wedding video. <laughs> <laughs> so I got in trouble. I remember getting real because I didn't know. You, you have to change the thing. I just used any tape. That was in there. Yeah, it was in there. And it I recorded like, over. Yeah, it was a tape. 8mm. 8mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just going to create a new file and, and, and uh, store the, it on the, dr- thought, on the cloud. Yeah, but I recorded over like really important like <laughs> yeah. family yeah. You know, yeah. events. Yeah. Well, this is still analog though. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, oh, yeah oh, it oh, is. Oh, oh, no. And then no, the next weekend. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm like, yeah, you just hit the next weekend they have, oh, there's another speaker coming. And we need you back. And I said, all right, yeah, no problem. Of course, I got nothing to do. And I come there and. It says, speech by Ustad Usama Cannon. Mm. And I'm like, you know, waiting for the, I don't know who this man is. And I'm waiting. And I, my job is to, right when he walks in to press record. A man with a turban comes in, a big a beard, red beard, he, elderly gentleman. I'm like, oh, salam alaikum, Sheikh Usama Cannon. And he was like, man, I know Usama Cannon. What you call me Usama Cannon for, right? Man's Rafiq, right? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I thought you're the, you look like a Sheikh. Right. I don't know. Like, I'm like, you you know. Yeah. yeah right? Another Arab brother comes in and I'm like, oh, salam alaikum, are you the speaker? They're like, no, I'm not. Then I'm sitting, I'm waiting. And it's like, by this point, we're like late. We're okay. like 25, 30 minutes into, you know, the speech. Yeah. Right? 
And this young gentleman comes in, incredibly handsome. Wait, not into the speech, into the evening. Into the room. In, into the program. Right, comes in, yeah, yeah. prays to Raka and gets up. And they're like, oh, hey, that's that's a, that, that's the shake. That's a yeah. shake. I, I was like, oh, that's Usama Cannon. I'm like, man, that ain't no shake, bro. That guy's way too good looking to be a scholar. <laughs> like, this guy's so, like, well put together. Like, yeah. what the heck? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I was just like, okay, mashallah. And he gave this talk that was so amazing. Like, it was an amazing talk. Like, he spoke in vernacular we can understand. Yeah. He had this ability to go in and out of pop culture references and quote old Sufi poems and and yeah. and um, say things that you thought you're not supposed to say as a scholar or as a teacher. Say things that we're not supposed to address. He was, I mean, I remember he made a, who's the, um, he made a John Legend reference and I thought that was profound. I'm like, did the Sheikh just say something about a kafir on t a singer kafir? Like that's where our minds yeah, yeah, were at yeah. that time, right, remember? Right, right. Like everything, and and then he talked about like uh, taking care of new Muslims. You know, he was just a really good talk. Mm -hmm. This then, is also like 2009, uh -huh. 2008, 2009. And then he okay. speaks to, and I was like, Assalamualaikum. We were asking, can we? We're, we're going to digitize this for the fund. Like he yeah. wanted it for the fundraising clip. He said, yeah, email this thing something something at talifcollective.org i said oh no problem and then mike and him are having a conversation because mike was there and they're like whispering on the side and it seems really intense mm -hmm. and by this point mike was already running something in chicago called chicago convert connection and the teacher there which is really important to me was a man by the name of professor amur muzaffar right <laughs> and he would teach this class and it was really awesome because me and him, i used to go to this class with them yeah. after the majidawa every single weekend so my weekends like by this point i'm just like why are my parents asking me where I've been? Like, they, yeah. they had no, they never, I realize now as I say it, I'm like, wait, they really didn't care right. <laughs> where I was going <laughs> over Saturdays, right? Yeah. I think they sort of trusted the process. Okay. I think they sort of trusted yeah. the process. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then Professor Amr Muzaffar is already teaching this, this class. Is that geared for new Muslims? That was, yeah, that was a new yeah. Muslim okay. class. Okay. But yeah. me and him only had conversations about films because he was working for Roger Ebert. He was working with Roger Ebert at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were talking about like Dog Day Afternoon. Um, the remember that movie Pi? Aronofsky's yeah. like old mm -hmm. films. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we were talking about all these movies. And he, he was like, who's this 15-year-old kid, 16-year-old kid? That's, like, dude, you have yeah. a life. Dude. Right. Like, what do you right. watch these movies for? And as listeners would know, we've had Omar on the show yeah, uh, yeah. a few times. So And, yeah. and he was great. As this is para like paralleling, Mike is already sort of knows about Talif. Okay. Usama's coming to Chicago once, Rahmatullah Ali is coming to Chicago once a month to teach the Book of Assistance at Iman. Right. Right. And it was just a room with six or seven people. That's it. It was like the Brothers Circle? This was before that. It was oh, it's for staff. It was that. for Iman oh, staff. I see. It, it, the Brothers Circle comes a little later. I see. Then for all intents and purposes, he buys out Mike's convert uh, group. Right, Chicago Convert Connection, yeah, um, which turns into another CCC, which is Convert Continuum Care, Convert Continuum Care, right? Correct. Um, and this is like this big buyout. Uh, really, was like you get all you know, and and Tatleaf begins in Chicago. Yeah. And my relationship with Usama begins in Chicago because there's only a few so, people. There's only a few people involved in this. This was Mike. And I think there's khilaf whether it's a buyout or this it's a hostile takeover. <laughs> <laughs> I, the thing was, I'm joking. I'm totally joking. If you you have to ask Mike how that conversation went, yeah. but like, because I, I just know that in Chicago, you know, there is there's a lot of kiss, you, you, you know, ring kissing. Yeah, that there you was, need to do, and Osama didn't always play that game. Sure, yeah, sure. that's fair. Yeah, yeah. um, there but there was also like, here's an offer. I, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very you're, on brand. You're right. You're very right. on brand. Right. Yeah. Like, very. On <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah um yeah. and then it was the people that were involved and was mike he, he quoted that movie like <sighs> non-stop it was so. his ringtone for a point yeah it was <laughs> do you remember that it was his of course ringtone. i do of course yeah. i do yeah. uh welcome to the family was was wild yeah. man um and i think then it was then it was mike swice a brother named ryan hilliard who of lives course. in canada now yeah he moved to canada moved to canada he did a short stint in dallas I remember, okay. yeah, after Perhaps, yes. Talif, after where Talif. he was like a youth director there. Youth director, got it. Uh, not ep Maybe Epic, actually, would eventually oh, would become Yasser Qadi's mosque. Oh, so but I think that he was a uh, youth director at Epic. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that was, so it was, yeah, and then it was um, Mike's wife, mm -hmm. Alia Bilal, Ali Bilal. I call Alia Baji, and some other people, but it was like a small group of people. Okay. So 
that was sort of the squad. So like, I just got like I have my drivers. It's the first person I've really driven is around. Is Al guys really involved with any of this? No, no, no. I don't okay. think okay. I, this was it. This was like the yeah. when I say involved, I mean like these are the yeah. soldiers on the ground. For yeah, yeah. Whatever. Not to use that terminology, but these are people who are like yeah just b- doing the things on the on the ground like mm-hmm. setting up and i was just around mike so he's like oh we have to set up for a thing so i just became now the guy that picks up this brother from the airport uh, or picks him up from his hotel osama you're talking about osama osama yeah. yeah and then we build a relationship yeah you know and we, we kept we get relatively close i mean i see him every single time when he's in chicago and and you know when he was in chicago you're gonna have a long weekend like it was gonna be a long weekend like you got a lot of explaining to do you want to go home because the day would begin at nine and end at like three in the morning you never yeah. know right um but this is like my our first exposure and, and then tat leaf chicago begins and then that first year what do you uh, okay so i'm curious i'm already graduate high school now yeah now okay. i just graduate high okay school. so you graduate high school you mentioned exposure what are those early encounters with osama exposing you to I want to be careful, but I want to also navigate into a conversation where I think you and I both just probably need, you know, I probably should have, yeah, should have, and it's been a long time in the in the making, and I think that we can just we can do it on air. I have no problem with doing yeah. it, you know, for the record, as it were, for the record, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and with Omar's permission, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure, go yeah. for it. It so, was it was a powerful. It was power. It wasn't not. It wasn't. It was new. Are you being exposed to something that would later become? reinforced in morocco in your studies or are you being exposed to like a heightened intense version of it no at this this first exposure he's like this is when he was like uh i'm just i'm brother usama got it like i'm bro bro what's going on bro like how you doing bro like that was it we'll get coffee we'll hang out there was no intensity okay it was very light you mentioned the long days and the you know your weekend was basically spoken for yeah you, you don't mean the khidma element of it you mean just oh 100 percent. i mean the khidma over it okay so that's what i'm asking okay about. oh yeah, yeah yeah oh 100 like you were you were sort of um always around like um i mean you didn't not enjoy it i mean uh, but look it wasn't at that point it wasn't different as like being part of your msa or you know like or being part like there was there was very little difference between that you're just around the teacher all of the time but it was like very similar at that time the demand like the expectations and demands not for me Okay. Not for me. I was too young. Like, what, what are they going to ask for me? Interesting. Um, I guess what you're saying is it was still kind of in its infancy. Infancy so in there Chicago, was, yeah. There just wasn't as much um, hype and he didn't have as much authority or influence. So, you, one, one of the one things one of things you have to realize about in Chicago, only people that were that would come to the events would know him. The major mosques didn't really know what yeah. was going on. Right. Um, he had very little visibility nationally. Yes. At all, if at all not much that was posted online at all this is the advent of youtube already so you wouldn't really find him right you sort of had to this was like sort of tell was sort of this grunge thing that was going on yeah, which was like you, good... you sort of had to roll through to see it yes. like i can't explain it to you you got to roll through yeah um it's obviously good, at this point there's a lot of the, the man and the metaphors right yeah, yeah, it's a great it. analogy yeah, yeah it is and 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 like yeah, it was like underground. Leaf is Bay Area grunge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. It was great. So, <laughs> so and this is Chicago, man. Remember, Chicago is already like you have. Whereas Chicago oof. is like no, no. Chicago, what would be the equivalent? It's like the city uh, where Mozart and Beethoven were. You know, it's I mean, funny. If we're, con- if, we're grun- note, sure. if we're going with the grunge metaphor. If we're going for for the grunge, yeah. On a side note, you know, it's really interesting. Just like in tech, yeah. how we, in the Bay Area we get exposed to stuff. And ah. It's like five years before anybody else yeah. does. We don't really know That's right. that. We don't really know how big how big it's going to be or that, like, that in five years the whole world is going to be like, you can say that for any tech company. I remember sure. NVIDIA 20 years ago was just like, yeah, that's where they make high-end gaming chips, right? Right. It's kind of the same thing. You're right. Thalif was on our radar by 2009. It was already a thing. Oh, like, we could was. feel yeah. the energy behind Thalif in the Bay Area by I, 2009. Because I, I, I moved here in 2009, and Thalif was slowly becoming a thing that people talked about and were quickly, going to Quickly, I would on say. Sunday. It became oh, a quick, very quickly, quickly, not remember, slowly. Remember that conference we organized? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. was one of the speakers, and by then, you know. So that was 2010. That's right, 2010. It was already a thing yeah. by then. Yeah. yeah. But but then, but as this is happening, remember, 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 like, there's already East Coast or West Coast has a bad rap in Chicago. Like, it's already <laughs> realized like the weird Muslims, right? Even the people that we've named mentioned, like, they're sort of not welcome oh, yeah. in the local spaces there. Interesting. There's no, like... You want to talk about... Even though the people you've mentioned, certainly, at ISNA are treated like rock stars. Over there, but in the, in the, in the, yeah, out in the community, in the yeah, Masajid. Okay. No, they, they would, I mean, at this point, there's like derogatory, like, Medkhali nicknames that are attached to them, right? 
like there was like sort of uh, you got to Google that. Do you want to define? I know. Do you want to? You're going to have to Google. You want to just leave it to the listeners what, to Google. Say that again. Like Let the Chinese is a sort of yes. very, very, very like heightened or hi- yeah. militaristic, even like the the difference between. Th- if I'm honest, I would say it's on record. The difference between them and like an extremist organization is by degree, not by type. Right. It's and, by degree, and, not and by type. Extreme Salafi is what. Extreme you're Salafi yeah. movement, right? Yeah. And that's sort of part of like, like sort of the younger people. Like Takfir and make, you yeah. know, basically, you know, everyone is either a Mubtadi or a Kafir. It's, yeah, nothing in between, nothing right? Nothing between. And um, there's, and a yeah. Mubtadi might as well have been a Kafir at that time, right? Oh, like, for sure. It might sure. Be the same thing, an innovator yeah. or a disbeliever. Yeah. So there's already this like weird, and now the the cool thing is that, oh, there's finally something in the city. Nice. Nothing's in downtown. Yeah. yeah. That was, they started using a place called American Islamic College, which yes. I think was the first accredited Muslim University yeah. in the 80s, but they unfortunately lost their accreditation. Yeah. But the one who was on the board of that masjid, who passed away, I think, in 2012, maybe, um, is Akbar Muhammad, is Imam Mortin Muhammad's big brother. Or a little oh, brother. Okay, yeah. He, he, he was AIC, on the board. Oh, we mentioned Ahmed Sucker. Ahmed Sucker. That I, I've said, but he yeah. was very involved with Involved in all school. of those. Uh, yeah. Ahmed Zaki Hamad. Yes. Oh, I don't know if he's yes. still alive, but yeah. that Quran project mm-hmm. is what put it puts AIC on the map. On the map. Yeah. And it's in this beautiful location. It's right in it front is. of the lake. Yeah. Not updated at all. No. I mean, it, it was, yeah. so Talib ran out of the, a dorm area. So there was a musalla in a dorm. I so that. the event would go on and you yeah. see somebody walking out in their pajamas going to the kitchen. It was hilarious. Right? <laughs> I and remember knowing, that knowing, well. And in fact, there were certain areas that were off limits. Yeah. To attendees, to attendees of Tel Aviv. Yeah. yeah. So, so mind you, so just so you know where our histories coincide, I mean, I'm on the board at this time, and I'm coming out to Chicago pretty frequently. Okay. As a board member, right. yet not as a employee. This isn't during the period where, I, where I'm working full-time at Tel Aviv for the two years. Okay. okay that okay. happens right before the uh, Pilsen space uh, right before 2016. 2016, right, right before that opens. I, I'm not there at that time. You're not I'm not there. in the picture at all. Right, this is but, when I exit out. But you know, AI, no, no, I know. But AIC, you're in the picture. AIC, 100%. Yeah, AIC. And I remember those moments. I remember, and, and you know, it was really beautiful because I think one of the great things is like Sidi Usama was really amazing at winning people's hearts. Yes. He was great at building a community, you know, feeling people, you know, there was a, welcome, there was a welcomingness around him. The, the brother couldn't, I think he had a hard time being alone at times knowing that there were people around so he would always have a group of people with him also on the clock like always on the clock like and uh, and yes you're right like i, I think his, his his foot was always on the gas even for things that probably didn't need uh, yeah. any attention right um so my exposure obviously at this time i tell him i mean i'm gonna go on the record and saying i mean i i, I contend that osama cannon was god bless him uh, was you know one of the in terms of someone who represented and was very comfortable in his Americanness as much as he was in the tradition, I think there were few people. There, there are few people. I don't. I, I think I can't I think, name any. Exactly. It was a once in a, a generation talent. A generation talent. Yeah. And I say that with all due respect to his contemporaries, people who came of age, converted, studied alongside him. Sure. I feel that, I mean, because it comes from Allah. I mean, that comes from Allah. So they may, there are others that I would argue are maybe are more qualified, studied more extensively, intensively, uh, without naming names. But at the same time, though, the, the charisma and the, like, really well, once I, in a generation there was talent. A vision, there, I think he had, a, he was definitely before his time. I think 100%. vision was something that his vision for was so clear. Yeah. And I think what was amazing about that is that he had this wonderful talent of bringing people in a building that would otherwise never be in the same space together. So you had an amalgamation of immigrants, uncles, aunties, people from, um, you know, the inner cities. And everybody in that room felt that Osama was speaking to to them. them. Exactly. And they could like, relate I to I remember him. I would, this is again, right around that time where I would accompany him on some of his travels um, as a board member. I would say, Usama is one of the few people and Talif is one of the few spaces where my six-year-old daughter and my 60-year-old mother can both feel equally engaged and equally comfortable. Yeah, yeah. And, and Osama had that he unique had that talent, talent. He had and that I, talent. because I know, like everyone from my mother's generation, and specifically my mother, my in-laws, other people that he met, he charmed the pants off of those people. And in, oh, yeah. in terms of as vision, much as uh, a young yeah. teenager, yeah, yeah. and who the was vision, totally enamored. Oh, the vision was absolutely. absolutely there too, because I remember having just a confidence. Yeah. 
in when I heard about when he would talk yeah, about yeah. the vision, just the confidence of what was being built. Oh, absolutely. That has been lost, I think, specifically in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. While other there's been other mushrooms that have popped up since that has not been that hole Replicated. has not been filled, filled sorry. Yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. It's a yeah. big gap because I had all the I had a lot of high hopes just from hearing the vision. Right. You know, and, and that's I, I think that, that 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 sort of dynamism that that social agility that he had. I mean, he could be in an Arab room and just be an Arab. He yeah. could be he could be in a black American room and just like be him. He could he could he could be with he could be Pakistani. You know, he could yeah, be whatever. No, no, no totally. Uh, it was amazing, and I think that gap between Pervez Bhai, Omar Bhai, yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, so and so uncle. Like, he introduced at the back in the community. Yes, which was a secret to everything. That's right. Which was feeding people and mm-hmm. and and like. My my, I remember I went overseas. Yeah, and my dad already felt a certain way, and I'll, I'll tell you that like you already like my whole family felt a certain way about okay. it, right? Okay, it was a non traditional route. They didn't right. come here for this, <laughs> you know. I didn't leave the south side for this type of situation. It's a mean girls reference. Yeah, um, but the <laughs> mean girls <laughs> reference. Uh, and let's the, get there. I mean, uh, we'll finish by, this I, point. Your your I movie want, references, by yeah. the way, are wow. You got me. Uh, you got me beat for sure. I'm I'm, I'm pretty impressed. Oh yeah, it, it mean, I watched Mean Girls recently. <laughs> That's why I have a new set of friends. There was a, there was, um, there was a moment. I think parents never. Some parents didn't like, you know, especially a lot of our parents who were like, "Oh, you're gonna be with the with the sheikh now." Yeah. Well, you think they're your parents now? Yeah, you know that whole right, piece. Right, sure. I remember like after it was Eid. My dad prayed Eid at the same masjid he just happened to give khutbah for, or Jum'a or something, and okay. I was gone. And he walks past my dad. And my dad knows who he is, but he's like, "Okay, he's a sheikh. He's not gonna do whatever. He's a he's a khatib, whatever." Mm-hmm. Like you know, he's not used to having yeah. this. Way. And he looks at my father and goes, "Oh, Mr. Hasib, where is that?" And he gives my dad the biggest hug, right. and he just starts asking about him. He's like, and I think my dad was like. My mom just told me like he was just moved. Mm-hmm. Now on paper, that's like a very simple thing. It is. It was yeah. such a. Re- it, there's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing extraordinary, but he brought back that as like yeah. the default. That's like, right. hey guys, this shouldn't be the, the 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 the. This should not be extraordinary. Like when people come to a space, they should be welcomed. This is yeah. not yeah. when they come to the masjid or they come to the sacred space or yeah. what we like to call the semi-sacred space, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that they should be welcomed like their guests of honor. Like right. they should be taken care of because exactly. he was teaching us, I think a big part of it, he is somebody that, um, you know, uh, learned more about him when I went overseas and met his in-laws and things like that okay. was I think he had a great affinity for Muslim culture okay. and classic culture. We call he called it, uh, Americana. Culture. Americana. Yeah. yeah. Americana. And, and this idea of like how he was treated by these Muslims yeah. that he went to visit that were incredibly traditional. And he was like, where is that? Like, where was that? Mm-mm-mm. And that's why I think the best thing to describe Talif in my yeah. relationship was right. it was, and I hope like, I think he, he, somebody described it as this: is like it was a community's living room, where it became the community's living room, mm. living space. Mm-hmm. And how are you treated when a guest comes to your living yeah, room? Yeah, exactly. Um, because I think you're right. I mean, I, on the one hand, everybody felt welcomed, but at the same time, people who deserve to be treated with an elevated sense of respect were also given yeah. that due. So, although there was so there was a hierarchy, it wasn't flat. Also, wasn't. and I think that's important. Which is hadith, right? Right. That's right. Put people in the rightful places. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, and that's a level of agility, social agility. I think you nailed it in terms of his one of his best qualities was this social agility that he had. Yeah, it was phenomenal. It so, was unlike everything we've seen. So then. Okay, fast forward. So fast forward that now I tell no, no, him. No, 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 hold on, pause. No, no, oh, no. I want to oh, oh. put a rest to this and okay. then we'll move on. Got it. So then he's passed and stuff came out, right? And all, you know, everything that transpired. Mm-hmm. I, I can speak shorthand right. with you. And I think for most of our listeners, I've either heard the show, heard me. You know, we can speak in shorthand uh, in terms of the context. How do you, how does Umer Hasib, right, reconcile that? So I, it was easier for me, I think, um, because I had left overseas at this time okay. and I was already sort of one foot in, one foot out and our relationship sort of was already sort of, it was close and then it was distant sure. and it was close and it got really distant. We had, a, we didn't have some sort of smooth, I mean, our, it was, a, it was an interesting relationship, which is not just me. I think it's for a lot of yeah. people yeah. because he was an interesting gentleman and it, I, I think, I think for, to, for me coming back. So I already had like, oh, I find this as like something that I'm not totally down with. This I'm totally down with. Okay. These are the things that I've seen that I'm like, ah, I don't know about all this, which are a little more aggressive, maybe hostile in environments at times. Yeah. 
Um, because he was he was like an intense dude. He was an intense guy. It was, I think it was just it's sort of like it goes back to Omar's point about vision and the I, confidence in vision. Yeah, that also means you're kind of Steve Jobs, which what, which what he did right. He did didn't he not take Islam and turn it into the iPhone? Oh, hundred percent. That's what he, he just. Oh, that's yeah. That's, that's all. No, no, hundred yeah. percent. But, but yeah, and no. as with these some of the some of these genius types. They, you know, I mean, it was no secret that Steve Jobs was a really difficult person to report to, yeah. was a really difficult person to work with. You know, Steve uh, um, uh, Wozniak has, you know, he, he saw the, the good, the bad, the ugly as yeah. far as Jobs was concerned. So but I think there's a lot of parallels there. There's a lot of parallels. Not just with that. Jobs, but I think in th th that archetype. Right, right. For but sure. Ask for your sure. question. No, sorry. I'm just asking, you said uh, uh, confrontation or whatever. D did you have... Are you saying you had some, is that something that, that came up or are you just talking about in gen general terms? I, I think, I think Kat, you said something about uh, hostile or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you'll I sort of see a call. very aggressive, intense. Um, I think we should, I think, I'm sorry. I, earlier I said, we, I dismissed it as saying we could just speak in shorthand, but I think it is important, I think, to kind of be specific about what we're talking mm -hmm. about. There were elements of a intense, toxic, one would argue, or one would maybe maybe say, work environment. For sure. Uh, for and sure. so there's okay, that. That's so for sure. Let's yeah. deal with that. There's yeah. then there's the then there's the other stuff. So we then which we don't yeah. need to. I don't. I don't really feel the need to comment on it. It's more about. I think to me, it's about yeah, yeah. about sort of the, that professional. Uh, aspect of them yeah and the impact yeah so there's a spectrum of like i think sometimes everything's wide. like there were parts of things that needed to be done that you have to say needs to be done and i think uh, some okay. people just are just like not used to because they're not sure. used to working in now mind you like this there's no staff in chicago when i'm there it's just all volunteer based but there were moments that i've seen i remember you know where things have to be like yeah. what was lost is there was such a focus on ihsan, oh, which yeah. is doing the excellence, that the getting people to ihsan, you got people to that by any means necessary, even if it meant the process sacrificed ihsan itself, compromise yeah. on ihsan, yeah. and that becomes a problem at times. So like, Agreed. if you get served, somebody gets served with a plastic cup, oh my god, oh. it was like end of the world. Oh. Remember, like it was like not, like I remember people crying. Um, <laughs> Like oh, wow. oh, I'm not. I, oh. I, 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 I was at. The, I, I, I have seen it, and I was. Um, yeah. Uh, it was like the, basically the, it was like at the receiving end here? of it. At the receiving end. Yeah. Of it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. There were moments like there were the, things. The, that, they were, the but, conversation was like, "Hey, like, why are you even here? Like, you just like leave. Mm -hmm. Like, if this is what the standard you're gonna have, you might as well just leave and never come back." And I, you know what? And I think. Like an, intense, like an intense, like an intense, those intense coaches, like, you know, oh. the Indiana Hoosiers coach or whatever. Oh, right? yeah, Knight, Bobby yeah, Knight. Yeah, Bobby Knight or yeah. something like that, right? Yeah. I think there was prob. well, I don't even know, actually, if there was a better way to do it. But I think that I don't, I don't devalue that in, in like, oh, in the sure. least bit. Absolutely. Because I think that we came from such an opposite styrofoam at the mosque culture that what I saw at Talif and what Osama instilled in that level of intolerance for anything that was even in that neighborhood, I respect it. And to this day, I, I feel like that was, that, that was not lost on me at all. Yeah. I think there was better ways, like, you know, things were not up to that standard. I think Osama could have handled it better, mm -hmm. but I think nonetheless, having that level of expectation, I'll never detract from that. Oh, 100%. Because you're seeing the ripple effects of communities that are, intentionally or unintentionally influenced by Tatleaf at that time. Right. We're all over America now, which the process mm -hmm. the organizers look like, no, and they're I'll, doing it great. They're doing I'll a great job. I'll be honest. Job. I mean, no, but I'm seeing, seeing that attention to detail change me as a person, as a host, as a, 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 a how I live, mm. right? Because I demand that level of kind of excellence from myself and from the people in my household. Yeah, and I think other there's, there's a great point. I, I, can, I can speak to how you've evolved through, I think, him, oh. your your relationship with him. And Absol for sure, 100%. I saw that real quick. He was younger. Uh, that's, yeah, that's for He everybody. was closer to your age, Omar. He was younger, he was younger, younger than me, uh, age-wise, yeah. but uh, he had a tremendous influence on me. I mean, yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, there, there, was, there are some teachers that teach you uh, knowledge and there's some teachers that teach you what's in the books and there's some teachers that teach you how to live and he was one of those people that taught you how to how to present yourself how to dress up You've, even saying yes ma'am no ma'am thank you carrying a handkerchief yeah car carrying a handkerchief wherever you go making sure you know you're presentable presenting yourself properly with the right people all of the time and then there was also learning by cancellation 
which is also another pathway that there's certain things you learn. You're like, yeah, I, I, that's something that I've seen. And look, the dude was a human being. Learning by cancellation. But he, you did sort of learn by cancellation at so times. let me ask you then. And then this is the point I was trying to ask you way a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. Okay? And we need to kind of get back. <laughs> Think of how we're going to wrap this conversation. Is that learning, learning by, by cancellation. learning by cancellation? How much of that is emblematic of just learning in, say, Fez or sure. uh, or or the Maghrib in general, right? Two, how much of that was mixed together with the proclivities of Osama Kanan? Yeah, I mean, his tendencies, look, his you know, <laughs> there's, right. a, there's a story of yeah. of a Shaybani who asks one of his students once a question about grammar, okay. or sorry about sajid as sahu about the, yeah, yeah. This, the, the, the prostration, and he answers forgetfulness. It, forgetfulness. And the story is long, but the end, the answer that he says, he he says he says a wrong answer and it's off, and he says, "I'm surprised, I'm surprised a woman like your mother gave birth to you." That's what he tells him. It's the craziest thing to say, right? You're like, bro, who's that? like, like he literally said the like, yeah. like, hey, like, yeah. I don't know what's the point of you existing right now. <laughs> exactly, right? Like, you right. you do nothing, right? We would call that toxic, yeah. In our generation, we'd be like, remember that is it's from, it's it's that <laughs> meme from an Adam Sandler movie where he's like, you know, the last fo- like he answers the question and the guy is the moderator's like, yeah, 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 yeah. the last five minutes you have offered nothing to, yeah. But anyway, yeah. I think it's like from one of the early Adam it's Sandler exactly, movies. Exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. I think it was yeah. Happy Gilmore, or whatever. The Happy yeah. Gilmore, exactly. Um, or Billy a, Madison, one of those. Billy Madison, or Happy yeah, Gilmore, right? Yeah. That's good. But yeah, so you had moments like that with them. I'm grateful for all of them in terms of what I experienced. I'm very grateful. Of no, it. no, no, no. Fine. But again, how much of that is Osama adding his own unique spice to something that is prevalent in either that part of the world, Morocco, the Maghreb, or yeah, maybe other parts of the world as well? Or how much of that is just, you know... I think it was uh, some of it... Be- at, at, at Osama first, Cannon. Yeah, at first it was definitely like something that he probably had taken from his teachers. But one of the things I had to... Re- and I don't want to get too deep into this part, but there was a lot of trauma that he faced growing up. I mean, the brother went through a lot, yeah. like a lot. Mm-hmm. And, and I think when things sort of became outside of... Maybe one Cuban art outside of the, the Sharia at times in terms of his adab and the way we deal with things as a collective happened because at some point the organization in this project became a mechanism and portrait of his own trauma. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. You nailed it. So I, I, I think that's where things, how can anybody, you can't do, you can't work like that. Right. So then, okay. So as a, as a cautionary tale, then, yeah. what are the takeaways? That's a great point. Uh, the takeaways for a cautionary tale, yeah. I think is to recognize that our community and us as students have to be committed to a a sense of excellence, a sense of a learning pulse, yeah. and more importantly, a deep connection with a multiplicity of mentors and teachers that we can have that keep us in check. And okay. once that idea of mashura, I think, is gone, yeah, and somebody to say like, you know, the, the, there's a, the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, he, he actually said, he said, don't surround yourself by yes men. In so many words. In so many words, right? right? right. That's what he said. He saying. mentions this in the hadith, right. Right? right? And like, what does that mean? It's not to say you have people that are overly critical. You had the opposite. You had the constant, like, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. And you're like, why am I doing this? I'm in the wrong job. Yeah. But the idea of somebody to just, where, where you could just put the mirror in front of your head and say, hey, like, this beautiful project that you're, you're, you're working on yeah. that could change the world right. has a potential of burning down. And that's that, that's that's risk, right? Mm-hmm. And again, what the what I will say about Sidi Usama mm-hmm. is the dude left it all on the floor. Like he did his job. Mm-hmm. Like he left everything on the floor. Right. And I think he gave everything. You know, I was reconnecting with some of the Beria folks here, which because Chicago is a different tale and the Beria is a different tale. I'm very. And I remember very. some. I don't know if I should mention her name, but she like built basically Talif in the Bay. Yeah. Like she was, a, you know, you visit her, and she was telling me stories like, man, this guy used to work till like 10, 11 p.m. at night and never really leave the office and sort of that work ethic i, I think there should be a balance one of the things i take is there should be a work ethic balance like family and right. friends so and that's, that's saying. great uh, yeah. way to approach that how about in terms of a cautionary tale around organizations that are built around charismatic leadership in general how much of that is kind of baked into the dna of islam uh-huh. and how much of it is i think uh, something that in the american context especially we need to be a little bit more challenging of and yeah. mindful of um, a is like we have a whole religion based off of charismatic. Well, that's what I. That's why yeah. I said it's kind of baked it's in based the off DNA. Of, it's based off of yes, like 
all the all the Sufi turuq are based off of charismatic yeah. leaders, right. or if they're not charismatic, right. at least they're leaders. A few episodes ago, we were talking with Yusuf Azhar, who kind of escapes this crazy like cult in actually Chicago of all places. But we, you know, one of the questions I asked him was exactly this: was precisely this was because he talked about how things that are attributed to the spiritual leader, the karamat, and so on, miracles, and can do this and that. I said, look, on the one hand. A lot of that is just baked is baked into the DNA, and by that I mean, you know, it's baked. That is part of our tradition: the belief that they are awliya, the belief special that people. there are people that are special that have a connection to Allah, that can literally see right through you. And we can go on and on and yeah. on. But on the one hand, and then on the other hand, there is we also have identified the fact that what leads to sort of actual cult-like organizations and structures is this idea of a charismatic leader to whom supra-rational uh, attributes right. are, or, or things are attributed. Yeah, I mean, cults are interesting, the idea of a cult, because the definition of a cult is a religious group. Yes. That's like the first right. definition. Actually, we literally, literally talked mean, about that in that but episode. But is it really? Yeah. yeah, it's literally a, a group yeah. of, it's, it's, it starts off with religion. Correct. And uh, you have negative cults and positive cults. I, I, I do think that, Look, even in the Quran, it says, وَجَاءَ رَجُلُ الْأَقْسَى مَدِينَةً وَيَسَعَ Like, Allah ta- he talks about the guy that comes from the farthest part of the city to warn people, right? Like, it talks about these very specific, the sort of, it talks about men and women okay. that have very specific jobs. Yeah. And they're not ordinary by any stretch of the imagination. So, we do have an affinity, and our religion is based off of a connection to other human beings. A senad. It's, everything is connected off of that. Even the people that are not part of Maybe the Sufi tariqah stuff, right? Where the Sheikh, you're all a quasi tariqah. Like well, even if they run, even the people that are anti tariqah, they're quasi tariqah. There they are. They, what are you talking about? They do the same exact thing, and yeah. they have the same benefits and the same, right? Um, like it's all it comes down to the same idea. You have cultic corporations, you have absolutely nonprofits that are cults. You know, you have right. the tendencies. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, you know. I went to a teacher. Uh, in, in, in Morocco and said look make and I was in this part like Americans remember this whole you go overseas and you're like Americans are all messed up we got it all wrong you know we should be more like this and I asked them please make do offer the Americans like we have we, our Islam is all jacked up basically mm. right and he said he said um, he said he said become endukum in Islam like how long have you had it for mm. and I did the whole like smarty pants answer like you know we've had it since the blah 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 right we had it since slavery. Ah, I see. Okay. I had the whole yeah. thing. And he's yeah. like, no, but how long have you had your community? I said, maybe 30 years, mm-hmm. really? 20? He said, look, he said, we've had Islam for 500 years, and mm-hmm. we haven't figured this out yet. Good mm-hmm. luck trying to figure out. We're a work in progress. Yeah. And we should accept the fact that we're not going to get this project correct in two generations. These institutions are just like, we're only going to know the success of all these, whether it's you know, the madrasas, and name them, whether it was Ta'lif or Darul Qasim or Zaytuna or this or that, we're only going to know their real success three or four generations down the line. That's right. If they last. Well, I, we won't know it. We won't know it, right? You mean human beings in human general. Human beings in general will <laughs> right. recognize still, their success. Long think, after we're gone. Long after we're gone. I think so. I think to remove everything under their feet so fast, hmm. we're just going to be a self-sabotaging, paralyzing community as opposed to at some point leadership has to get up and be like, hey, next one in line, we got to get the job done. We know what to do. We know what to not do. Let's get this job done. Let's get, let's right. get it done. Yeah, yeah. We got to move past this real fast. So I, I don't want to dwell more on this, but I think that as I as I said, dude, on mic, you know, you are wiser than your years. Uh, that's, that's not fair, but no, I'll, no. I'll, I'll make it easy. Um, no. You are, fair. right, Omar? You agree? Yeah, I agree 100%. <laughs> it's been, definitely been a pleasure. So, uh, <laughs> so I want, but, you know, I, I'd be remiss, though, if we didn't give um, some conclusion, not conclusion, but because you are also a work in progress <laughs> and you're... But if we didn't, you know, um, get us to where we are today. So talk about, I want you to highlight some of your... So highlights? Yeah, yeah it's very yeah. simple. So I go by because this point... You, by the way, you've shared a lot. And I think, you, you know, again, your analysis, your insight, your commentary on certain things, so insightful, so Thank insightful. So I appreciate that. That I think, or we could just talk for hours. This could be a Joe Rogan episode. I'm, I, uh, I know, honestly, this, yeah, is, this yeah. was probably... I was really excited when you invited me. It was an honor for me because you know that you're one of the... Very few podcasts I listen to, 
Most of the podcasts I, I don't really get attached to, listen to, but this is the one I listen to the most um, because it's. I think you tend to. This is like the Forrest Gump of podcasts. I am the Forrest Gump, Gump of, of the podcast. Muslim community. <laughs> no, no, I've real said talk. that. I it's, mean, it's so there's so many real stories. Talk. I, I, I am the simpleton who has just been at the right no, no, place no, no, at the you, right you, time. You, no, 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 there's a lot. No, it's true. That's, and that's I have tough. no, I have no qual. Like maybe, maybe you know, I'll be honest. Maybe 15 years ago, I, I'd like. I'd be kind of saddened by that, <laughs> but but you know what I mean. I'm not the yeah. main, as my kids would say, I'm not the main character. No, 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 yeah, no, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not the main yes. character. But now, being in my 40s, late 40s, almost 50s, I'm very comfortable saying I'm not the main character. Oh, uh, uh, and, 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 and I am the Forrest Gump of the Muslim community. I've been at the right place at the right time, meeting some extraordinary individuals, and that's why I do this show. Mashallah. Because I want to, I want to capture their stories. I want to have them on the show. I want to have this kind of conversation with them, and I want to shed light on the tapestry that is Islam in America. Yeah, as my former co-host Zucky used to like to say. Yeah. So, 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 so by this so point, please, yeah, by yeah. this point, it's like two thousand, right? Uh, two thousand eleven ish, yeah. maybe that summer, maybe a year after that. I don't know. So, so what compels overseas. you to go overseas? I want to. I just one. wanted to study Arabic. For okay, that's it. And why Morocco? Morocco because I wanted to go to Egypt, but then the revolution happened. <laughs> so people said no. There was no way that was going to happen. Why was Egypt on on the top of the list? Everybody just went to Egypt. That yeah. was it. Yeah. Everybody just studied Arabic in Egypt. There was Egypt. I mean, you know, in the nineties, Egypt was it. Like it was Cairo. Well, that's what I was going to say. Even as late as that, because I mean, that when I yeah. right when I wanted to go study abroad and I wanted to study Arabic. Egypt was the top of the list. Egypt and, and, and I found myself in Cairo. I mean, it's it's you. A, I'm I was fa- I'm, I'm I'm saying it's. I find it fascinating that years later, I go in two thousand five. Years later, Egypt is still. Even till this day. Right, right. Wow. I mean, for, first of all, it's a one-way flight. I think there's a one-way direct flight from Chicago to Cairo. Okay. A. Fair enough. It's very easy. You just get off the plane and you're in Cairo. There's, um, a, this, there's also some stability. There was stability. Well, I mean, well, there wasn't there briefly, so but in generally think speaking. Think about how big, think about, okay, think about it this. Think about how big Azhar is and how many, their graduating class yes. is thousands of people. Mm-hmm. My graduating class was 24, mm. so I'm 23. Okay. You're talking about people from all over the world, different Salafis, Sufis, Ikhwanis, but, and fill in the blank. They're Diobendis, you know, but mm. they're all... Not to mention the various nationalities and races. And the, yeah. the Indonesians, yeah. the yeah, Filipinos, yeah, yeah. the, um, uh, sorry, people from Singapore and Malaysia, and then you have everybody from the UK. It becomes, Martin Lings lives there. Even Martin Lings lives in Cairo for a very right. long time. Right. Where we often forget, he actually spent a, that last portion of his life in, in Egypt. Like, people start, Egypt is sort of the spot, and it is the cradle of civilization for a lot of people. I mean, Alexandria... Uh, has the largest, you know, the library, library. of Alexandria. Mm-hmm. You have it's a very important place, and given the fact that it's the oldest running large university in the world, and then the things that come out of that. So there's a lot of access in Egypt. Yeah. Oma However, dunya. Huh? Oma dunya. Oma dunya, right? Yeah, Mother the, of the world. It doesn't. I mean, right? You and it will always be. You don't get that uh, hustling and bustling city, right? I mean, I think now they have like better malls than us. They have better burgers than us. Better pizza than us. Like I all hope that. so. I'm going yeah. inshallah in December. Yeah, it's yeah. It, oh, mashallah. Yeah. yeah. So that but, doesn't happen. Then, then. Okay. So, Habib Omar comes to Chicago. Got it. Right. Oh, I remember that. Twenty thirteen. Exactly. Twenty twelve. Twelve. Yeah, 2012. yeah. and because he came here a, first. He or, came here first. Yeah. Then he goes there. So mm-hmm. then I'm like, oh, Yemen. I should go there. For some reason, something happened to my visa. Mm. I couldn't go to Yemen. Part of it, I think the civil war did and start. The civil war had already started. So I, something happened. My visa, didn't whatever. So I was like. Hey, let me go to Morocco. I think I asked Sidi Usama. He connected me with Hamza Weinman. Do you know Hamza Weinman? Yes, he, I know the name. You know the name. So he runs an Arabic facility. His father is incredibly important, um, a figure. And uh, I take an Arabic exam and I failed it. Like, miserably. Like entry so, level. The entry level. Yeah. Like, miserably. Like, I was like, oh, so hard. I got nervous. I got really scared. And Is it oral? It was, yeah, it was an oral exam. Oh, okay, okay. And it was in Marrakesh. So Marrakesh was mm. out, but I still was insistent to go. So I ended up mm. going to Fez. Got it. And I landed at Fez. I booked my ticket a week before. Mm. My parents thought I was obviously crazy. I, I go back. I, I'm with a backpack, a small suitcase, and a bunch of Apple Jacks and Waffle Crisps, you know, in my bag. Okay. And um, I go there and I uh, in, find an Arabic institute and I enroll there. And I'm there for like two months and it's just, Every single day for eight hours is Arabic. Okay. And then wow. at nighttime, I enrolled into a thing called Darul Quran, where okay. I was learning Quran. Okay. And then I find out about the Qarawin. They have certain conditions to enter. So I want to meet those conditions. I see. Obviously, because I'm really excited about this place. It's right down. I mean, the Fez, the old city is really small. So it's just walking. So I was, I started going to Dhikr gatherings. I, I met 
this one man that now becomes my primary teacher mm -hmm. and a mentor of mine until this day, where I go to a dhikr and a zawiya there. And I'm now I'm like introduced to the zawiya thing, right? right which are these like lodges uh -huh. for all intents and purposes. Right. Sufi lodges. Sufi lodges. They're the real semi-sacred space. Yes. Or right. not, not real, they're original. 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 Sorry, sorry. That's yeah. a better way. I'm so sorry. That's what I'm at. No, no. Yes, they're, okay. the, they're the original semi-sacred And in the place. subcontinent, you would have the Hanukkah. They're the Hanukkah and, and things and, like and, that, right? So it's the Hanukkah yeah. of the, of, yeah, exactly. Of Same the, thing. Of the Middle East. Um, yeah. And I remember West. going to it, the good and everybody sitting and they're very particular on who sits where and the mm. colors of the jalaba you wear. So that, like the, the darker colors of the middle, they were very, like, very orchestrated again. And it's very beautiful. And there's a, there's a seat in the middle and there's a man that comes and he grabs my shoes, puts it like under his armpit, sort of sits me down, puts my shoes under my seat, and he's serving everybody back and forth, welcoming them. And I was like, and then he's and there's clearly a seat in the middle that's for somebody special, mm. like it's an important person. Yeah, yeah. And he sits in the middle of it. And I asked a person who happens to be Mulay al Hassan, who becomes a really important person, his little his son, who becomes like a really close friend of mine. Okay. Right, we become business partners eventually. As well, like we start to do like work together once I once I come back, and uh, he's like, I'm like, who is that? He says, you don't know who that is. That's that's Sheikh Adis Al Fas Al Fari. That's the Grand Vizier of the Qarawin now. Wow! Like he's a headmaster, right? Beautiful regal figure. And so he takes me to the office. They say, okay, look, there's a program. First, it's going to be just for Spanish people, yeah. but you can be the only American, and it's an exchange program in the in the madrasa, the the masjid of the Jami'a Qarawin, the, the Masjid area, and they're going to begin to do the things that I had nothing to do by this. And, and I and I had, in that point, I was like, okay, that's that's awesome. I'm going to join that. They signed me up. It was fairly easy. I go to the Wizara, which is, you know, whatever, and do the governmental stuff. But what happened was that I lose my money. I don't have any money by this point. And my ATM card wasn't working. I end up uh, losing and getting kicked out of the, of the apartment that I was staying in. And I just started sleeping on the bench for like a week. So me and my bad, I'm home. Like I'm like, oh snap, I'm homeless. <laughs> this is before like Viber hasn't come out yet. Remember Viber? Yeah. Like uh, Viber is not out yet, right? I don't. I don't, I don't Viber know. was like before. It was pre. It was WhatsApp and Viber and WhatsApp one basically. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Viber okay. was like in a, a horrible connection. Now you can get like LTE there. Before you had to either get a calling card or something called a teleboutique. There are these big payphones. I'd call my parents off of those or internet cafes. Right. And they were like, they'd be like, oh, how's everything going? Oh, well, and I'm like, yeah, I'm great, man. They're treating me so well. I got there at 180 pounds. I'm 124 pounds. Wow. Really? Yeah. Wow. You lost 55 pounds? 55 pounds I lost within those. Like, I didn't eat anything. I didn't have food. And then, so, like, first of all, I can't imagine you at 180. Because 180, you'd be on the. I'd be big. Side. I was the heavier side. You were, okay. right? I can't. Wow. I mean, because before that, I just, you just ate pizza and yeah. and creatine and went to the gym like that's what you did when you're in high school right you had like two pizzas <laughs> yeah, creatine, yeah, go to the gym. yeah yeah like uh and eventually that catches up to it you. catches up to you right <laughs> in like, high school you know you your metabolism you is through the roof yeah yeah and and so you know you lose a ton of weight and um i remember going to the masjid and this is where everything sort of begins this okay. is where the story really begins i go to the masjid and i end up i know the caretaker that there at the qarween and he allows me to just sort of rest in the toilet. the daytime i used to go sleep Mm -hmm. And I hear a man in the back starting to read this um, salawat that I've never heard before. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadan abdika rasulika nabi wa ummi. And all these people would come next to him and they would recite this yes. book. And then he would give a small little dars or slash dua after Asr. And he would be there from Asr to Aisha every single night. Yeah. Uh, particularly Wednesdays and Thursdays. But in the summertime and the better days as much as he could. And I went there and I just sat next to him. And... Um, he had a son with him whose son looked really old. So I was like, how old is this man? And we started to build a relationship because I do it every single day. And I would just come and visit him. And he asked me, and he was blind. He couldn't see. And all of these scholars like would come and kiss his hand. And he asked me once, his son said, do you know what we're reading? And I said, well, he's like, this is called the Dala'il al Khairat, right? This book on the a compendium on prayers on the Prophet ﷺ. And it's the most recited book in Fez after, outside of the Quran. I would argue in the world. In the world, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was. A, it used to be the second most popular book, at least in the Muslim world by Correct. far. By like, everybody, Any had the average Muslim household had a had a mushaf and the, 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 the right. 
that was this until it, the Saudi petrodollar until started the petrodollars, going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And oh, and then on Thursday nights they recited the like they, they recited the burda, the burda sharif or something. Like, like this like was that. this was this Adi. was stand Adi. This was standard exactly. Yeah, this was the practice that spiritual gardens were everywhere, everywhere, and everybody was invited to these spaces. Correct. And he says, "Hey, where are you staying?" I said, "I'm kind of between houses right now," and I was like, "Sharat to Anas, like I'm kind of homeless." <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, he, he he digs into his pocket, takes, he said, you're going to stay with us now, mm-hmm. right? right? And I end up living with him and I tell my friend, I said, hey, he's like, where are you living now? What's going on? Why didn't you like, I was like, oh, I was like, why don't you call me and tell me you're homeless? I would have you. I was like, no, somebody took me in. He's like, who's like, this man, his name is Sidi Al-Ayashi Al-Filali. He's like, wait a minute. You mean the Sheikh Sidi Al-Ayashi Al-Filali? He's like, yeah, he's like the 124 year old yeah. Sheikh. I said, yeah. He's like. How did you live with him? I said, yeah. And I just started living with him. And you spent Ramadans with him? I spent three, four years with him until he passed. Ramadans with him. Extraordinary. Uh, and how old was I he mean, actually? You see, he was 120 yeah. when I met him. Without exaggeration. Without exaggeration. Wow. He was born in 1886. It, the Qarween Library has an archive on him. Give. Uh, uh, he heard the fall of the caliphate in the radio <laughs> when he was a young boy. Yeah. <laughs> Give our listeners a peek, and I because I know some of these stories, but I want I want them to hear it from you. The the peek into a day in the life of, of him, of someone like Shef so Hayash. somebody like him would be, would be a he would wake up in the morning at Fajr or right before right before Fajr for about an hour, and he would recite Quran, and I've seen him. I, my cousin was there with him one time, and I you know to visit. He did a khatam al Quran in a day. It's a true story. He's done it in one day, a khatam al-Qur'an. And he woke up in the morning, he'll begin with Qur'an and read the hajjud, and he would read uh, something called the Dua al nasriya the Dua of the Oppressed. And he, by, by memory, all of it was by memory, and sing some uh, parts of the Burda until Fajr came in, and then he would pray Fajr, and then he would begin his day with uh, some sort of dhikr and an hizb. And then he would teach us who are there a little bit. And then he would do a little bit more. And then he would take a nap throughout the day, or in Qailula, which is a midday nap. Yeah. He would wake up, and then he would find, he was a very wealthy farmer, very wealthy farmer, but you wouldn't see it right. when you, you met him. You wouldn't know it if you, you wouldn't know it by meeting right? him. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And he, he had he had 13 or 14 children, and he's only, f- and by the end of his life, only four of them were alive, mm. right? Um, and his wa- mother, I didn't get to, sorry, his wife, I didn't get to to meet her but she was considered a wali of Allah like a very very righteous woman and then he would go to the Qarawi'in or a place called the Zawiyah Wazaniya which is in a place called Babur Gisa which is a gathering that was started by Imam Jizuli himself and he was the inheritor of that gathering so he would basically manage that whole space make sure that they could and he's a sheikh by this point so he's like he just there, mm-hmm. um, and then he would end the closing door, and then just visit, visit, deal with visitations every day. People would come. He would visit. come visit. People come visit, and then his son, um, he uh, would basically have bags of grain or food and go around and just do de- and deliver it to people's homes that needed it, and then he would uh, finish his khatam of the Dala al Khairat, do an entire khatam of it by himself. It took two hours for him, and then he would uh, rest or eat dinner, spend time with the family, and he would end his day. That was his full day. Right. That was like an average. He day. would read the entire Dalai al Khairat yeah. or just the like what no, 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 no. broken into days, right? Nope. He would do the entire Dalai al Khairat. <sighs> wow. Every day he would do the entire one. You, it is broken into days. That's how you're yeah. supposed to read it. Yeah, that's You do it every single day. Wow. I mean, that would keep you nourished for a while, huh? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough keeping up with the daily. With the daily, but yeah. he would do it every single day. Right. Because in um, some of those salawat are like tongue twisters. So, you know, th- there was even a story. Uh huh. Where he went to a gathering once and he came really early. Okay. For about half an hour before the dhikr even started and the majlis started. And obviously, like, why is this sh- it's a young boy came, maybe 20s, and he okay. was like, why is the sheikh here so early? Like, mm. sheikhs have an entrance. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, the dhikr was done, whatever. And he, he kid goes back, goes to sleep. And see, the ayashi came to him in a dream and said, my son, you know why I came early? He said, I knew if I came on time, everybody would stand up and visit and say salam to me and give me an entrance. And I didn't, I wanted people to come here, not for me, but come here because they're making dhikr of the Prophet. Right? And I said, I didn't want to have bad adab with the Prophet. So, mm. um, so like things like this was yeah, so extraordinary normal. Extraordinary. Extraordinary people. Now, what happens is, this man like really takes care of me. His, his daughter-in-law, um, it was the only woman, and it also makes me emotional thinking about it. Yeah, was the only woman my mother would let me call mom outside of her, because she's like she was the one she took care of me. She got me clothes. She would cook for me. I mean, she would take care of me like her own son. I mean, like there was. I don't think I've seen anything like that 
um, without asking for anything, yeah. anything, no money, you know, this, like there was nothing they got out of it. It was just like, you're part of the family now. Mm. Um, and, and you're talking about, you know, there was a Zawiya there called Sidi Ali Jamels, which is the Sheikh of Ibn Ajiba. He's buried in, in Fez. And you, you, Thursday nights, I used to go there. But I used to go there not because of dhikr, because he used to serve sweet bread and tea. And mm. I was just really, really hungry, <laughs> right? And that's the only reason I go there. And yeah. I remember even, even the people that were there, they would notice, like, the boy starts salivating when he sees the bread. Yeah. So the caretaker would go in the back. He would make a bag of just full of bread to the top and give it to me without anybody looking. So I'm good for the week, <laughs> right? Like these are the kind of small things that you, it goes beyond, like these are the experiences that you really go overseas for, right? So then that happens. And then I, then I start my classes in the Qarabin. Okay. And then he says, look, you've started, you started school now. There's only two places you're going to go to. When Amer there were Americans that came through that I never visited because he said, you're not going to visit people. Mm. You're not traveling. You're not going to this maqam or that maqam or this station. You're going to school. You're going to the zawi in your home. That's it. Yeah. And I did that for three years. Um, and, and in, in the those th three years, like what do you like? What, what so is the the first year I did program. the Arabic. So first year I did the that yeah. exchange thing I told you. Right. Then the second year I go to Mauritania for a bit, which is a different story. Then I leave and I go to Ayn, a place called Ain Khashib. That's where a man named Murabd Ahmed Fal was, yes. who passed away. He was a son-in-law of Murabd al-Had. That's right. So I'm there and I was. He at, passed away more recently. Re like very very recently. Like, yeah. Yeah, very recently. Incredibly handsome, mm. regal gentleman. Again, like mm. amazing, just personality. Re really committed to his books. I mean, uh, I think his last inheritance, his wasiya, before he died, was protect my books. Right? I'm not going to go to because we could talk about that for hours, but that was a different chapter. I got stung by a scorpion once there too. So, yeah. So, so I got stung by a scorpion there. It was a crazy story. Um, for me, the kids yeah. would like point at me and laugh and I'm like, they were like, oh, Adi. I'm like, guys, wallahi, this is an Adi. Like, it's a scorpion. Yeah. Like, this is not normal where I come from. Then I come back like and the then Indiana I... Indiana Jones of Muslim scholarship. Huh? <laughs> you like the Indiana Jones no, of no, Muslim I'm sure scholarship. There, are there have to be others. No, but then I came back <laughs> and then I, I, I enrolled into the Alamiya actual program at the Qarawin. Yeah. And that takes about another three years. Okay. Right, so this is now my year two there, and now I have a three more years, and that's where Alhamdulillah, like I got to uh, yeah. study with some really cool teachers, some Sheikh Sheikh Idris himself yeah. in class, uh, a man named Sheikh Al Abu Bakr Al Amrawi, students of Sheikh Abdul Hay Al Amrawi, Al Badruddin Al Humaini, Sheikh Arabi Majami, like these wonderful teachers. Right, so the Alamiya program, if you could really briefly, like how is it different than say? The Darsa -e Nizami, which is sort of more ubiquitous in the, in the Muslim world. Well, it, yeah, the Darsa -e Nizami, which comes out of the yeah. subcontinent. Right. Um, this is um, based on sort of but it itself, Malikia. It, it itself is from the Niz, like the Nizami. It's, it's from the Qarawin yeah, yeah, itself, yeah, yeah. has made their own program. Okay, and it goes got through. It. Yeah, so basically, once you study the, the Mutun yeah. or the basic text, text, those texts and those chapters are split into different chairs mm -hmm. and they're taken from something called the Muqtasar al-Khalil yes. which is basically our first book of fatwa which I would assume in the Maliki school, in the Maliki school yeah. right which right. is maybe, second to the Muwatta it's probably um say, so the Muwatta and the Mudawana they won't take uh, you won't yes, study full that's right but you'll take rulings from that so mm -hmm. they're used as reference books as and generally. that's in the Muqtasar the al no, which is Sahnun codifies mm -hmm. and then other books so like Egypt will have like a, a Dardir's manhaj of the Maliki school Right, mm -hmm. um, which is their sort of. Can I tell you something about Sahnun? What's up? And the first time I ever heard the name, this, this is probably like circa like 1999, uh -huh. 98, 99. I wanted to get a hold of Sheikh Hamza, so I bump into him at the bazaar at Isna. And this goes back to Isna, and I asked him for his email address. And at that time, you know, he was like super like anti email, like <laughs> like www, like the World Wide Web was like Beitul and Kaboot. No, it was Beit and Kibbutz. Oh, subhanAllah. And from the Quran, like a house that's like flimsy. And <laughs> so he had all these interesting theories about the World Wide Web. But anyway, he gave me his email address and it was like sahnoon at msn.net or something. Yeah. So that was his that was email the, address. If you, go to, if you go to Mawli al-Hassan's home <laughs> yeah. in Fez. Which By the way, Mawli al-Hassan, for the people who may not know, the listeners, we're talking about Sidi Osama's father-in-law. Father yeah. yeah. Who's a student, one of the only living students of the great Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib. That's right. If you go to his house, there's a picture of Sheikh Hamza and it says Hamza Yusuf Sahnoon on it. It doesn't say, yeah, it's a picture that I've never, yeah, it says so. And in, in, is a picture of him there, like a young Sheikh Hamza. And I remember asking away, he's like, yeah, that's the name, Sahnoon, that's the name we were given. Um, really? I guess. I would have to ask Sheikh Hamza. About this. I, I wonder yeah. what the story I'm gonna it ask. So, well, it was so long ago. Like this is like ten years ago. I want to ask him for the show. We gotta save that. We gotta yeah. write a note of that. This is like eleven years ago. Yeah. Right? yeah. So when yeah. that when that when that okay. happens, yeah. 
then I became just being very serious okay. in my studies. And yeah, yeah. So you started to study grammar. You started to study mm-hmm. the Al-Fiyah of Imam Malik, Ibn Aqil's Sharh. Yeah. And then, I, I'll, yeah, I'll shorten this whole piece. No, no. It's just, but, honestly, there's I, a lot. I feel bad as a host right now. No, 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 no. Because you no. are a guest. I have not fed you. All you've done is feed us. I haven't uh, fed you anything. I'm just know, telling you a story. No, That's no. not that and so, and so I, I'm just kind of feeling that. Okay, yeah. I'm feeling the pangs of being a bad host. No, no, no. No, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. You're, this is great. I mean, so to shorten that, the one story that I would that sticks out of this is obviously, I, so Alhamdulillah, I finished. I was my third year. And Meanwhile, they, we've got yeah. construction going on in every house around me for some reason today. Yeah, seriously, it's like I'm coming from all angles, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> no, it's, a a it's a well, Sunday. Who, who, works who works on, on a, Sunday? a Sunday? Yeah, which contractors are these? I want to track these people down. Yeah, sure. Or next time you do a renovation, yeah, exactly. find out who these Sunday contractors are. So, anyway. that's I'm also being introduced yeah. to like a subki and jama jama and then also like um this is my first time really studying because uh but it's shafi right huh That's so true. when you study the maliki okay. school you study shafi usul mm, makes sense because they were like imam juwaini imam ghazali you study the waraqat you study the mutasawa of imam uh, of imam, uh, imam al-ghazali and something called um in, in some other texts of course mm-hmm. uh muwafaqat you know was really is an important text mm-hmm. uh the furuq by imam al-qarafi Al Qarafi, who's really important for for yeah. for Morocco and Andalusia particularly. Of course. But anyways, I won't get too yeah. into that. Um, One of the world experts on 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 um, Qarafi, of course, is Doctor Sherman Doctor Jackson. Doctor Sherman Jackson, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and and I believe also Doctor Intasar Rub in Harvard. Is she? Okay. I know she's a big. I haven't had the honor okay. in measure, but yeah. I do follow her a lot yeah, in her yeah. works. But and now I'm also being exposed to scholars outside, mm-hmm. so I start to sort of study with Sheikh uh, Muhammad Al Kitani. I studied with Sayyid Akinza Kitani, who holds, who is a sheikh of, of Sahih Bukhari. So I studied Bukhari with her mm. um, and other people. But now I'm in my, I remember this happened and this was sort of like the really big moment for me where I'm, there was a Baluchistani brother that came to visit and he wanted to visit see the Ayashi. So I took him to visit. My exams are next week. I'm really like, now I'm, I'm like, it's, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, I'm, I got to do well. Mm. Right. So I'm honing down on these. And then he already told me, like, give me the orders. Like you can't leave anywhere. Right. And I tell him, uh, he, there was a Baluchistani brother that wanted to come visit him, but he also wanted to visit a man named Walil Hashim al Ghiti, who is another student of Sidi Muhammad Hamakibi, and he's the sort of the Sheikh of the Hashimiya or the Habibiya, which is the order of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Habib yes. in Meccanus, right? right? Mawlil Hashim. And uh, I've always wanted to visit him. And that's a fascinating history, by the way, right? All the people who claim lineage. Who claim lineage, yeah. To him, because of, you, 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 so many you can't talk about that without talking about Abdul Qadir Sufi. Sufi and, and Dr. Umar Farouk. Dr. Dr. Omar Farouk and, yeah. and Sheikh Hamza yeah. and uh, Abdul Hai Moore. I mean, Abdul all Hai these Moore, people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so even, even the graduates, like you had, obviously, so in my generation, a better representation of the Qarawin is somebody named Sheikh Ismail Bowers. Right, we he was. I graduated twenty eighteen. He graduates twenty twenty. Okay, why right? is he a better representation? Well, his mother's a Drisi. His father has a house there, and he's just a better representation than me by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. So I'll really go for him because he's like he's the guy who I'm like he's the guy like he was the he was the all star. Like I tip my hat like he's the he's the man, and I love him to death, mashallah. And outside of us, you have Sheikh Abdullah Ham, uh, Hamd Ali, who I mm. met after at like a Bawadi in Chicago. That one out of restaurant, <laughs> uh, and he did the Olia program. But there was somebody even before that, um, his name Ke- Dr. Kenneth Honerkamp. Yes, of course. Georgia. He went to the Qarwin too. People don't know that he went to the Qarwin for three years as well. Yeah. Um, now Honerkamp and uh, uh, Alan Godless. Alan Godless. Those are both people that I have to have on the show. Dr. Kenneth, he's, he's but those he's two great. people I want to go in person and record in like Athens, Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> and wherever uh, I forget where. Um, Honor Camp. Honor Camp is in Athens, Georgia. Oh, he's also he's in, right. he, he, I think he's the one who's in Athens, Georgia. Yeah, he's in Georgia. He's, sorry. He teaches Islamic studies yeah. there. Right. And uh, that um that night, yeah. the brother wants to visit Siyashi. Uh-huh. And in front of the Sheikh, he says, Can you please take me to visit the resting place of Sidi Muhammad ibn Habib? Okay. And I'm like, bro, come on, bro. Like and I was like, Oh, I can't. The Sheikh says, Sheikh Sheikh um Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, yeah, she tells me, No, no, take him. You're gonna find the glad tiding there. And I said, I don't want to go, right? Why? And I do the Why were you reticent? Because I'm here to study. I'm not here to take wow. people as a tour guide. Got That's it, where my it. mind, I'm like, dude, right? Yeah, 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 like, yeah. I'm not going to waste my, like, I'm already, like, really, I have anxiety. Like, I'm not a native Arabic speaker. Yeah. This is already different. Like, I have so many things to do. Like, you're kind of getting my way, bro. Right? <laughs> like, you're killing my flow. And I'm, I'm very structured. 
<laughs> my problem is like I can't just like I have to study in a structured yeah. program. That's why I, I always had a hard time doing private studies, which I now I'm better at. Okay. But I always the reason I went to the school is just because I know I'm right. better at structured programs. Got it. And he was killing my vibe, man, killing my flow. And I, I had my like study playlist in Karawin. You know, I had my like I have Mauritania playlist. I have a Fez playlist. I have an Eritrea. I have these playlists that I make, right? Uh, is that's a different? I'll share I, that I'd with love you later. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a look at your uh, uh, and put, throw it up on Spotify or whatever on, people I'll do. I, I don't know. Yeah, and, I, I don't know how Spotify works. I assume yeah. that's how it works. Yeah, <laughs> and the shake was okay. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm go find it. Take him to a train. This this brother's amazing. I don't know if he's but he's he was an amazing brother. I, I I like I had a uh, I have a real strong affinity for him. I never met him after this. Okay. I don't know where he lives anymore, and I've been trying to connect with him, <laughs> but. We go to the Zawiya, mm -hmm. and my whole, I've always wanted to visit Sidi Muhammad ibn uh, Sidi Mullah Hashim, because I think I had a dream about him, and his face just was was something that was, he, he, he was really attached to me for some reason, because mm. he's a very beautiful, elegant man. And I go to the rest, find the, the resting place of Sidi Muhammad Habib, it's this beautiful Zawiya, I take him there, and I'm, you know, we're making dua, mm. and in my head, it just occurs to me, maybe I'll see Sidi Mullah Hashim today, Maybe. It's in my head. A man taps me in the shoulder and says, Like, you want to go visit Mullah Hashim? And I'm sitting there like, yeah, there's no way this is happening. There's no way. <laughs> like, there's no way. And you had never met, you had not met him to this day. Never met him till this day. But you had heard of him. I've heard of him, whatever. Usama. Something's already, Mullah, Sidi Usama never really told me about Mullah Hashim. He told me about Mullah Hassan. Oh, I sorry, never, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah Mullah yeah. Hassan. But Mullah um, Hassan's in California right now. Right. Oh, right. Because he, he was split guys. time between. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. with you guys right mm -hmm. now. Like, mm -hmm. um, sorry. And and I'm like, there's no way this is happening. This yeah. is not the beginning to a dope story. Like, there's no way. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. This literally is literally what I'm thinking. <laughs> and I look at him like, yeah. He said, he there was a brother who passed away, a man, Wali named passed away, named Sidi Ali, who was a caretaker of Zawa. You'll see a picture of him. He, he's in the, the meeting with Mountains book. You'll mm -hmm. see him. He has His face is like, he was a lumberjack and a tree fell on him. Oh, yes. He was young, I, so you'll right. see his face a little deformed. A little disfigured. Um, yeah. yeah, disfigured. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, he walks up to me in his really Berber voice, like he had this really crap. Like this was out of like some. Do you, you remember that Willy Wonka scene? <laughs> nobody ever goes in, nobody ever comes out, right? You I don't, don't remember? I don't know that I movie. Think I know as well. about you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, when yeah, the guy comes, yeah. this was a sort of like same energy here, right? <laughs> he's like, he's like, you want to visit? I think I was like, right? And I was like, yeah. He said, yeah. The guy, this this other man from a place called Nador, which is a different city, he goes. He says, Ruh mul al Surat al Asr. He said, Come pray Asr and we'll 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 go together. Yeah. I go, I get a I go get some coffee, come back, pray Asr, and see the Ali starts, I meet him and he starts laughing and he starts pointing at me. He says, You want to visit Mul al Hashim? And he starts it's like a weird laugh. Maybe I'm making too much of it. I don't know, but that's how when I'm ahead, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> You're sticking to it. Yeah. Right. You're like, the cinematographer that, in you. That's the, it's all coming ahead, yeah. right? I see the lights all angled yeah. properly, silhouettes. And uh he uh, and the 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 man says, "Okay, let's go visit Mole Mole uh, Mole Hashim." And I'm we're walking. I said, "Subhanallah, so you're from here?" He's like, "No." I said, "Oh, so you've been here before?" He's like, "No." No. I said, "What brings you?" He's like, "I'm just traveling." Bye. And I say, "Okay, man. Like, there's okay, dude. All right, fine." Let's, he said, "You know where he lives?" I said, "I don't know, but I think he lives in one of these doors in that way, that direction." I said, "This is great." I said, "Can you stop? I want to get some desserts." So I want to get some sweets for the show. Yeah, I want to visit yeah. right empty-handed empty-handed and i go and he starts he gets to some door and he knocks on the door and nobody answers mm -hmm. knocks on again and nobody answers and i'm like yeah this is too good to be true there's no way <laughs> and i'm like yalla i don't think he's there he said la tathleef min sunnah doing thing three times is from the sunnah mm -hmm. so he knocks the third time and there's a voice he's like who is this and they said uh there's some people that they want to visit mullah hashim and all of a sudden, I, the door opens and I hear, Marhaban, Marhaban, Marhaban. And it's Mullah Hashim, right? I come back, he feeds us, he's whatever, and we're speaking for two, three hours at this moment. And then he says, Look, why don't you come back tomorrow if you don't have anything going on? Like, come back tomorrow, I'll, I'll be here tomorrow, inshallah. And I'm like, and there is this beautiful, like, I'm talking about, like, he cleans, he's serving us tea. He's cleaning up after us. I try to help him. He said, no, this is my job. By this point, he's already like in his 70s, 80s. 
And uh, ama- it was amazing. And he leaves. And so I leave. I get back and I'm just in a state of like, did this just happen? Mm-hmm. I go back to see the Ayashi. He says, I told you you'll find something good when you go there, right? Mm. He said, I told you this would happen. I was like, all right, this is one of those journaling moments, I guess. <laughs> and like, this is one of those epiphanies. Yeah. And then I started going to his house every weekend right. um, when I'm okay. there. And I just started living in the house. So there was yeah. a living room and I would just sleep over there. And his son becomes one of my teachers, Mola Abdul Kabir. Um, and I get really close to them. I end up graduating 2018. I'm back in America. Uh-huh. Get my first job. When I'm in America, by the way, like I come back and I was like, oh, I'm going to go get a, work in IT. Yeah. Like I'm oh, not wow. like I'm going to start really? teaching. No okay. way. I had no buy-in. Like I had no, but there was no Cape and Cal ready. It was like, oh, I'm going to go back <laughs> to school. ready. Yeah. There was no <laughs> like, like it. thing. Like it was just, I didn't like, that was the difference about me and some of my contemporaries. Like they were sort of. Like, they had this sort of trajectory, we're going to come back. I came back and I was like, I guess I'm going to start applying for schools. Yeah. Trying to be like, oh, maybe I should get You'd into... You'd be surprised, CS. though, Omer, because we've had, you know, we think of, uh, I think Omer asked this, or Omer remarked about this when we had Muslima on, mm-hmm. Sheikha Muslima Pramel, and, you know, we were... Like, like she she was talking about it, especially from the perspective of a female yeah. graduate of Man, Azhar. Of Azhar. Whereas of her Azhar. husband, even the differences between Jamal's trajectory, Sheikh Jamal's trajectory, and hers is 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 also different. Yet, even in Jamal's case, Sheikh Jamal's case, like it wasn't like this automatic plug and play, like the cow yeah. and, to quote you, the cape and cow yeah. were ready to be donned and and boom, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're you're Batman. You know, so it, it wasn't like that. It was much more. Touch and feel. What's going to happen? What am I going to do, do with life? My life? Yeah. You have this moment. Have you my, done any? Tr- have you done any kind of education in no, the United I mean, States? No, not not yet. Right? Right? No, mm-hmm. not at all. And okay. not, especially not in this part. And I start thinking about like, oh, should I go to? Like, it was literally, should I go to? Should I go to study divinity? Yeah. Or yeah, should yeah. I just like get a professional thing and like? Right. My, my, I was literally gonna. All, like by that point, I was set. I'm going to get into like consulting or something, there marketing, finance. Like yeah. that's what I'm going to do. That's what I was set on. Right. But you did do some business you does that does that come no but that comes all oh, like that's, that's later. Okay. I mean, that's a little irrelevant to okay. the to the story itself okay but at this point and when you say business you mean like from a, like entrepreneurial like yeah, of, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 sure sure um okay. by this point imam badruddin calls me again and says hey we need chaplains at the cook county correctional so i said yeah i'll do it i can do whatever so i sign up and i start chaplains in division 10 and that's my first gig didn't make money at first then made just like you know you make a few hundred bucks here and there right yeah and but i'm there a lot okay and that becomes a really i was doing two years and i now i still go in every now and then yeah but i was full-time maximum prison security mm. i was doing wow. i was doing chaplaincy there and i met some of the best friends i made over there some really good people right that came out i actually was a little disturbed just because you're you get you know you're obviously in the industrial complex you're in the you're in you're in the you're in the stomach of the beast as they say mm-hmm. you're in the den mm-hmm. lion's den and mm-hmm. it's bad you know and then i would start going to the state pen which was really, really bad. And that's where I have a relationship outside of him that with Rafi Peterson, oh, who Uncle now Rafi. becomes, yeah, now he, now he, by this point, like we're like really close friends. Wow. And he becomes like a really close mentor to me um, till this day. And now fast forward, he has this halfway house called House of Kemet and he put me on the president of the board. So like I'm working there it's usually try to go there. We do like Arabic classes and I basically okay. write the Islamic curriculum. Right. Right. Very, very simple, very so- basic. And then... I'm just like, man, I want to start learning. I, I stopped studying. I realized mm. I need to start like engaging. And there's a sheikh that nobody really knows about named Sheikh Muhammad al-Imam that lives in Al- Al- Alexandria now. But he was the imam of this very low-key mosque. Alexandria as in Iskandaria? Like, Iskandaria. Now, he's, there, he's there right now. Okay, okay. Um, but he was a direct student of Sheikh Sha'rawi. And um, meaning his son, Sheikh Shadawi, and his son and him are best friends. They're like this. And he was in Chicago. In south side of Chicago. Doesn't speak a lick of English. Thank you. Hello. How are you doing? That's it. <laughs> right? Beard up till here. Yeah. And I have stories with him, man. And I was like, he he was actually Abidullah Evans, Sheikh Abidullah Evans' teacher. He was, he, Rami, Dr. Rinashivi knows him really, really well. And I start to, and he's cousins with Habib Omar somehow, somehow. So this is like, weird, why is, what is he doing here? Yeah. And I've never really asked him, like, yeah. what are you doing here? Because I, I don't know, it's like, I bake at the like, what are you doing? Like, why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> type of thing. It's the going like, like the Osama question, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, uh, he sits, he, I started to study with him randomly. And he, and I started just, bec- my job then was prison chaplaincy, going to that masjid, studying Nahu, Sarf Morphology. There's a book that I wanted to read with him and comparative fiqh. That was all I did with him. Mm. And then I would just start driving him around. Mm. 
Like he needs to visit somebody who's sick and then going to do a janaza or going to get his hair cut, whatever that is. And he, and I was just with him all of the time. And then he's like, Hey, do you want to become the Imam of the Masjid? Like, do you want to just work at this mosque? We'll pay you whatever. SubhanAllah. He did, he got paid maybe a grand or so a month, wow. something like that. Wow. Worked there all the time. Nice. And this is an out of mosque. So the weirdly part, I had to start giving Jummah khutbas every other week, but it had to be 35 minutes in Arabic. Mm. The whole khutbah in Arabic. Nice. At the moment, it was like, oh, man, this is really daunting. Yeah. But it was really good for me. Oh, yeah, right? I bet. Obviously, I bet. it was really, really good for I me. Bet. Um, and uh, amazing exercise. It was an amazing yeah. thing to do, right? right. And I, I don't know why he trusted me from any stretch. That's, that's but wonderful. then uh, I started to work in that mosque. Okay. And that was like my first real, I was like, oh, this is kind of happening. Mm. And then uh, obviously sort of, I started to do little stuff with Ta'lif. Ta'lif. I taught being Muslim, whatever. But I was right. never really involved with Ta'lif yeah. in a professional capacity. Got it. But then I started to work uh, with him and he became somebody that, and, and I have stories, man. Like I have like Halloween stories with him. Like kids, he, I remember him calling him and said, like, Omer, uh, uh, go get some candy. He's like, why? There are a bunch of kids asking for candy here, right? <laughs> and and so sweet. Yeah. And they would come and I, and I would come there and he, they would open the door and all they're all dressed up. They're all dressed but up. But they think he's dressed up because he's got, they're like, oh, look, it's Gandalf. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and he's, <laughs> and there's whatever. <laughs> And then obviously the perennial uh, masjid uncle comes and says, Sheikh, yani al-haram, yani al-utlat al-kuffar, this is whatever. And the sheikh could have given him like, uh, like convert, like he had his dalil, like his proof. Mm -hmm. He could have said like, إِذَا جَاءَ الْمَعْنَى, إِذَا غَابَتْ مَعْنَى, غَابَتْ حُكُمْ Like if the meaning is gone, then the hukum is gone. And then all he could have run circles. All he says is this, he says, he said, Anta tankur atfal al halwa? You're going to say no to kids when they ask for candy? Right. And that was it. And the kid, was, guy was like, I have nothing to say. But I just saw this amazing. Yeah. And that's why it was really easy for me to come back and never go through that identity crisis of coming it. back in the, in, into to America. Yeah, yeah. Because he just had that bridge. Oh. It was so easy for me. It was God sent. To, yeah, it was so easy for me yeah. to do that. May Allah protect him and preserve him. Right. Because um, a lot of people fall into that. Fall into that sort of, oh, we need to create a utopia here. For sure. All the Americans are right. evil. And and that, that was really, it's, that was like a shortcut. Right. And then I think I get my first uh, big job at Islamic Foundation. Okay. I was there for a year and then I end up doing a tenure at Tali for a year and three months. I was like their first director of religious affairs. Yeah. And yeah, and then now here we are. So before I let you go, and, and I'm glad you brought us to literally now here we are, <laughs> but I, I want to, as we conclude, and this will be kind of the way we wrap, is you have, you know, God has blessed you to spend some or encounter some amazing individuals through your travels, through your studies. For those of us, and especially I'm thinking of our listeners and all, I mean, Omar and I sitting in this room with you. Those of us who may not get to encounter these amazing individuals in our lives, how, what, did, what words of advice do you give to people who may not have those opportunities, but live here and can, can potentially encounter some extraordinary people right here? What, what sort of advice do you give to young people, to people in general, in terms of you know, taking advantage of the people that they have in their lives? And, uh, and and learning and benefiting from people the way and, you and have. And I'll just, I'll just add something to that. Have. I think what's extraordinary in talking to you yeah. is the amount, mashallah, I may yeah. I continue yeah, to yeah, give yeah, you this barakah, yeah, yeah. the amount you've accomplished in a sh relatively short yeah. amount of time. That's right. So if you can also even talk That's about almost like time management. Yeah. Uh, well, like how I, do you... I was, I'm really bad at time management, so I shouldn't <laughs> give any advice on that. It's just, I, but, uh, well, I don't literally mean time management. Just in yeah. terms of how do you, how do you prioritize yeah. time to get the results i guess yeah. so the first thing is i think i uh, hopefully this like i'm still i think relatively younger so i hope this like this is weird. origin story is sort of weird because like yeah. i think i'm still going through an origin story of in itself yeah. right like in, in fact if you were so confident of yourself i would take you down a couple of notches <laughs> so, so yeah. well done so i don't i don't know if i'd really yeah i mean honestly and, and it really is like just I, I was just like a like i still see myself as this like really yeah. like lost weird kid that yeah. Just I just enjoy learning Islam. Yeah. It really comes down to that. There's no real right. like I just really like studying and learning and reading right. about this really beautiful religion. Mm. And I think it comes down to just having these wonderful experiences with people and just this need to share it. Mm. And I think that's like if you say what's my like passion, passion. is just learning and sharing and that's it. I mean it's you fuck right? I mean it's it's yeah. what the it's what the prophet said. I mean when you know, I mean when God loves a person, he gives them, you know. He, he gives them some and, right. and look and I know that again like 
things I've even said or things I have my opinions about now and things I've read, I may look back, I may be 100% wrong in a lot of them. In five years from now, I'm going to look and be like, ah, oh, I kind of, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Right. Maybe in full, like, and I hopefully, you know, uh, uh, you know, if a person, whoever's in the same state twice, two days in a row, they've been duped. So there's like, I can't wait to like, this is a part of my story. Like meeting Pervez by and meeting you is still a huge landmark moment for me. And I'm not just saying that, like, mm. This connection had to happen in the right time at the right moment. And like you guys are libraries quite literally. I mean, you're a library in the fact that you have a podcast and you have experiences. And I think that mm. keeping these connections of like elder brothers okay. and and other scholars that are the Mr. Miyagi's. Usama used to call it the Mr. Miyagi's. Yeah, yeah. That people really don't know. Um, Daniel son. Daniel I mean, he son, would say yeah. that. He would literally say that. Yeah. It, it's like they don't really know of all these amazing masters and teachers yeah. and and leaders that are in your community that you can take so much advantage of. Thank and then the second, I think, is if you can, if you can, travel, not to say that you're going to get something better overseas, but travel because you have an appreciation of what you have in America yeah. and what you have here. And you have a your finger on the pattern of like the different cultures and the beautiful manifestation of Islam in different places. And that really puts like, we can do this. Right. Like, we can do this here. Like, we're going to have a beautiful community here. Now, like, that's the sort I'm willing to die on. Okay. They're talking stories over the time. It's like, yeah. no, this can happen. Like, it's yeah. going to happen. I believe in like, not a utopia, but I believe that we're going to create an amazing intergenerational Islamic experience that get, goes beyond the confines of sectarianism, yeah. but is actually very much ours that we have ownership over. And it's organic and lived in. And lived in. Yeah. And inshallah, we're the pinnacle of hospitality, of yeah. knowledge, and we're going to create institutions and, 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 chi and, and children that are inshallah some of the best representations representatives of humanity mm. um i would say it, it always it all, and I, it, it begins with hope like it always began with hope it always began with hope and it began with gratitude and like you said i think like there's the story's not over yet um <laughs> and even when we die the story's not over yet yeah, yeah, um yeah. and i like this there's a there's a deep sense we, we we're trying to have a legacy but we don't really know we're part of a greater legacy mm. and you don't know that unless we, i think we look at our elders look at our predecessors even the likes of you know even beyond you know the the last 10 years that yeah. um, imam um imam dawood faisal yeah. from harlem right uh akbar muhammad wali akbar all of these amazing people yeah. that have gone and studied and learned and made my life a lot easier made my life a lot easier like you want to talk about accomplish things in a short period of time that only looks like that because you're around you're you know they say live learn you know live um uh, live to be a thousand years old by how live with study with 10 people that live to be 100 mm. and you get a thousand years worth of knowledge yeah and that's just all it is man like i think there has to be yeah. a really strong commitment to like honoring the past yeah and just and just building for the future you know so you know, it's funny, uh, kind of to end just on a light note, Perez, you, you said the Indiana Jones, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually it's actually a really uh, apt. Good, good, yeah, apt, mm -hmm. apt uh, description and metaphor because I feel like we could definitely have you on just oh, to yeah. talk about one specific experience. And that could be like <laughs> Temple the, of Doom. The, yeah, Temple, Temple of Doom and then <laughs> well, Dial of Destiny it. and so yeah. on. So, I'm inshallah, that good that we look forward good to having one. you back, inshallah. No, absolutely, and, and, Omer. Uh, yeah. uh, I want this to be, yeah, the first of, inshallah, future stops. It will be my honor and pleasure. And I'm, I'm really honor, honest by saying, like, this is a landmark moment for me just oh, to be here. Please. This is a coming age. Well, so. I just want it to be a landmark in the sense that, you know, maybe you go back and you listen to this 10 years from now or 15 years from now or, you know, 20 years from now when, you know, I'm not even around anymore oh, and, gosh, and, and you're able to it. listen to it and, you know, you can reflect back on kind of the a moment in history. Yeah. And where we were and inshallah where we will be. Inshallah. So, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, though. Thank you oh, for thank saying that. Thank you for that. having me. It's my honor. And see the uh, pervade pie, yeah. you know, it was, he's also a teacher in the khatib and a leader in the community. And you're also a teacher in lead. So I'm, I'm really humbled. You guys would even think this was worth your time. So oh, please, more than, was. more than worth our time. <laughs> well worth our time. But I guess uh, as we let you go, where can people maybe reach out, engage you, um, you know, find out more about you if you're willing to kind of engage the, the broader engage masses, yeah. I, 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 um, I'm I really know. bad at it and okay. everybody makes fun of me for it, but I just started like an Instagram. So let's see how that okay. goes. Okay. Uh, it looks like some uh, 1990s youth preachers Instagram. Yeah, let's say, look how relevant I am, it's guys. Like, from, like, No Way Home, right, where, where, the, where it's, like, Tobey Maguire's uh, yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. He's like, oh, uh, do you have a costume or are you pulling off this youth pasture look? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and obviously, like, you know, I'm around at, okay. in Chicago and Tatleaf. And, yeah. you know, I'll, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm just began traveling and seeing other communities. 
We'll see how that goes, man. Inshallah. Yeah, Make you're here. You, I mean, I didn't realize this is like a week uh, long, a week long uh, programming they've been doing yeah. here. Shout I think out to uh, Lubna Sheikh for bringing me out. Yeah, Shalom. yeah, mm. absolutely. So. And I think uh, I think it's just a matter of people not because I think once people do hear you and counter you and engage you, be careful because you'll just be traveling all the time, and you you also want to kind of strike that balance. It is, you know, what's really weird. Honestly, given I, I, give, I, given I, the I'm, traveling piece, yeah. like the whole like going overseas, nobody bet on it because I hated traveling. Oh, I see. Like I can't stand. Like I'm such a homebody. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Make dua that it doesn't burn out or anything. No, no, this, no. Inshallah, you're, you're still young and uh, and yeah. and pre preemptively forgive me for any mistakes that I'm going to be making in those ten years. You know. <laughs> I'm not all that in a bag of chips. I, I, I recognize like that. that this, is like, this really is becoming like a time capsule then. Because yeah. you're almost talking to yourself 10 years from now. Yeah. It's it like, uh, it's yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. like Matthew McConaughey's uh, Oscar speech, right? Where he's like, <laughs> I'm talking to me so three years yeah. from now or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you Mayor. For me, yeah. No, no, what Mayor. It's been great seeing you. Yeah. Great uh, sitting with you. And uh, I know. I mean, this this is Rogan level. Yeah, podcast. Been for a I think I, I mean, I don't. Know, I haven't clocked it, but um, the, anyway, we hope the the, we hope the listeners enjoyed. And as always, thank you for listening. If you want to contribute, if you want to support the show future uh, road trips that Omar and I can take uh, to record in your fair city, please go to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence, become a monthly patron. I know I've said this in the past, but we want to start having content that's going to become available. Uh, I'm going to dig into the archives for it uh, only to patrons. So please do go to patreon.com. Every little bit helps uh, leave a review, leave a star rating on iTunes or wherever you find your fine podcast. And as always, if you have questions, comments, uh, for us, reach out at diffusecongruence at gmail.com or you can hit us up on Facebook or Twitter. Like you, uh, Omer, we are in the very infancy stage of a, of a of presence on Instagram. So hopefully we'll be able to build that out as well. But uh, again, thank you as always for listening, listeners, and you'll catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank <laughs> you.